What's up, guys? On this week's show, we are on vacation. So it's going to be a special episode this week. we got a couple movie reviews for you and a special guest interview. Now, hopefully, if you are hearing this, that means that I am not dead. And I actually posted this and my flight landed safely. If you never do hear this, though, I died in a fiery plane crash and I will miss all of you. But that being said, we have a fun extra special episode this week for you guys. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. All that and more <laughs> on this episode of One Giant Leap for Geeks. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for Geeks. I've got no strings to hold me down, to make me fret or make me frown. I had strings, but now I'm free. There are no strings on me. We're not reviewing Avengers Age of Ultron, though. Because <laughs> that song is in the trailer and he, say, he says wasn't that. Is that from like Pinocchio or something? It is from Pinocchio. Good job. Good job. High five. You did it. Nice pop culture reference. So, yeah, we are reviewing Netflix's original movie. I think so. Because it, it's. <clears throat> it, it's from the series, but it's not actually an episode in the series. I think it's no, its own it's separate movie. movie. Yeah, Netflix original movie, <laughs> Black Mirror Blunderbuss. <laughs> Bullshit. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll say spoiler alert, Amber didn't care for this movie. No, it's, it's Black Mirror Baby Wipes. I mean, <sighs> Black Mirror... Brussels Sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> Black Mirror Butterscotch. Uh, no. Black Mirror Bandersnatch is the actual name. I think I gotta write that down. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a interactive movie where it's pretty much, if you are familiar with choose your own adventure games or books or anything like, like that. Goosebumps. Yeah, kinda sorta. There, there's just, basically you watch the film and at different points throughout the film, it will pause and give you an option to make a choice for the character to affect how the rest of the story plays out. And it's about this video game programmer in like the 1980s, and he's working on this game that is a choose-your-own-adventure game, and the movie is a choose-your-own-adventure film. Normally, when Amber and I do our movie reviews, we normally do the mullet style. Uh, this week, we wanted to do it a little bit different because it's really difficult to talk about this particular movie without spoiling it. So we are not going to do it mullet style. So I will tell you up front, if you have not seen Black Mirror, Booty Meat, or <laughs> <laughs> Bandersnatch, then do not listen to this. Now, if you don't care or if you have already seen it, don't worry about it, but this will be spoilers the entire way through. I, I try to put my thoughts together on it without spoiling it, but I really can't talk about it without just outright spoiling the whole thing. So you have been warned. Now, that being said, the movie itself is very meta. It is not only is the programmer making a choose your own adventure game in the movie and the movie itself is a decide his path but the story becomes about him not having control and him becoming self-aware of the fact that someone i.e. you the audience is controlling his decisions throughout the movie and I thought it was really creative in that way like I I, I mean okay choose your own adventure movies are not a new thing. They've been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, I think like way back in the day, they used to have it like in theaters where they would stop the movie and somebody would come out and go like, okay, well, do you want this to happen or this to happen? What? And they would have to change the reel and play. So this isn't a new concept. Well, I, I know that it's not a new concept, but I've never heard it like in a movie theater. Yeah, well, I mean, not, they haven't done this for probably 60, 80 years or something like that. Like I said, this, this was a long, this was like back when film was still like a new 
kind okay. of thing. You know, not quite silent film era, but not too far from that, though. And it it's not a new concept, but in the way it's been presented here, I think it has a fresh take on it because the character is aware that someone is choosing his decisions. Because most of the time, the story just plays out like, well, this is how it was just written. You know, no matter what you pick, it, it doesn't actually have any effect on the character and their knowledge of, I could have did this differently. And that's what I enjoyed about this. Now, Amber didn't like the movie. Like, nope. at all. <laughs> like, she was unhappy with it, not even 20 minutes into it. I was just like, kill me now or just end this movie. And And I, you know, spoiler alert, I, I rather enjoyed it. For the most part. I will say this about it. I, I've always been a fan of choose your own adventure games. I've always been a fan of choose your own adventure books. I like video games where there's like different conversation trees and different things that you say and do affect how characters react to you, how the story plays out, how it ends, all that kind of stuff. Like I have always been a fan of that because I, I like playing with the idea of your choices matter. And it's not just this, well, whatever you do, no matter what, it's always going to end this way. So I think I was more open to the movie from the outset than you were. But I will say, compared to some of the other Black Mirror episodes, the story itself is, it's it's kind of average. You know, not mediocre per se, but it's it's nothing like, amazing like the whole gimmick is what makes it good the, in my opinion now you didn't care for it now was it that you didn't like the story or you didn't like the fact that you had to choose what happened in the story the story was okay like you said it wasn't like the best Black Mirror episode because no. we both really like Black Mirror. Oh yeah, no, no, we've watched every season since it yeah, came out. Yeah, we really like it. But I don't know. I just my attention wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Like I just felt very bored. Mm -hmm. It was very repetitive. Uh, and honestly, I think that's probably your biggest issue with it because I know that you don't like <laughs> you hate when I go back and rewind stuff I in movies hate it. and want to rewatch a part again. And so I think that, honestly, that was probably your biggest obstacle getting past, and you just couldn't get past that, that it kept restarting. But part of it, though, too, is because of the decisions that we made, it made us go back. Like, if we – I don't think there's a perfect ending to this, per se, but I do think that there is a series of events that if you chose certain paths along the line of the story – you probably wouldn't have to go back as much. I think they still design it to where you have to go back. At least way. probably once or twice. Yeah. But I think, okay, for example. Now, um, what I did while we watched it was not only did I kind of break down what was happening in the movie, but I broke down the decisions we made to get there. So throughout this review, I'll kind of pepper in like, okay, we did this at this point and yada yada. And that's how we got to whatever. So when, when the movie itself starts out, he is working on this game and he goes to this video game publisher who is this like new company that's starting up and they're really popular and they have like one of the biggest game designers at that time working there. He, he the reason he's there is because he gets a job offer and he meets the, the lead programmer there who's working on this game called Nosedive, which when we watched it initially, I didn't catch the importance of it until later because do you remember the game he was working on? Mm -hmm. Like, do you remember what it was? Yeah. He like falls and exactly. Yeah. Which becomes important later once we, you know, get a little bit further into the story. But the lead programmer, he tells him after he accepts the job offer, good because you have a choice at that point. And the choice is whether or not you want to take the job or not. And we chose to accept the job offer. And right after that, the lead program, he kind of seems disappointed. And he puts his hand on our shoulder before he walks out. And he says, wrong choice, you know, mate, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then leaves. And it fast forwards to five months later. 
and the game comes out and it's a flop. It's a zero out of five stars. And the uh, Stefan is yeah. his name, our main character. And Colin, I believe, is the name mm-hmm. of the programmer. And Stefan, he's watching the review on TV. And he's really pissed off about it. He's with his dad. He's like, oh, well, you know, what did he know? What is that and the other? And he's like, no, I, I'm going to try again. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try this again. And then the story resets back to the moment when we go back to the, the, the game company and try mm-hmm. and make the decision whether or not to take the job offer or not. So f- even from the outset of the movie, it fucks with you because you assume, okay, yes, obviously he's going to accept the job offer, but you're actually not supposed to do that in order to progress because technically we saw a few different endings to the movie as we were doing it. Cause technically that was the end. And that's why it made oh. us go back because we made a bad decision. So the story ended early. So would the story would have been different? Cause in the beginning it makes you choose what he eat, breakfast cereal he eats for breakfast would have been different <laughs> if we chose the other ones instead of frosted flakes. No. Well, yes and no. <laughs> No, in the sense that the important stuff wouldn't have changed. Yes, in the sense that, remember how they showed that ad? And I was like, I wonder if they did that. They do show a different commercial depending on what cereal you chose that morning. I like Frosted Flakes. Yeah, so. (laughs) Over the other weird one. Yeah, but I mean, it has no bearing on the story as a whole, though. It was just a fun little thing that's just in there. Probably just to get you into the habit of choosing exactly it, it, to it's show more, you what the movie's gonna be like yeah uh, it's more like a think of it like a tutorial yeah you know to kind of get you like okay this is what's going to be happening and it's going to pause for us to mm-hmm. give us time to make a decision it doesn't give you a lot of time i think you get ten about like seconds. 10 seconds yeah and it's just he like you that. gotta decide so after we do the time jump backwards and we turn down the position or actually there's an important bar- part before that. When we do go back, we meet the programmer again, and Stefan knows the name of his game and knows why it crashes now. Because in the first time when he shows him the game, he's seeing it for the first time because it hasn't even been released yet, and he's mm-hmm. still working on it. And he, and the game crashes the first time he shows him, and Colin says, like, oh, it's some kind of buffer error or some such shit. I don't know, some technical jargon shit. <laughs> But Stefan knows the name of the game and knows why it crashed this time. And then later, when he's demoing uh, the Bandersnatch game to Colin and to the guy who runs the company, Colin actually knows the book and the author and stuff like that, which he didn't know the first time, and Stefan had to explain it to him. So it was kind of like this weird thing of, even though we made a wrong decision and went back, the characters actually still retained some of the information from that prior path of decisions that we made. Mm-hmm. They're not fully aware of it because he's like, well, how did you know that? And he's like, I don't know. I just know, you know, they're not fully aware of it, but they do on some subconscious level know what happened already. And I thought that was an interesting take on it as well, too, because later in the movie, Colin talks a lot about, alternate timelines and parallel universes and you know the decisions we make every time we make a choice whatever our two options were even though we made one choice there's another reality that splinters off where we made a different choice Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like this infinite cycle of that's the whole infinite universe theory like every time there's a decision that has to be made whatever choice you make there's another universe that's instantly created where you made a different decision and that just keeps happening to everybody over and over and over again and I was like, that is a cool little little thing that they put in there that they didn't have to. And like I said, it was things like that that made it interesting to me. Now, you didn't give a fuck about none of that shit. Nah. <laughs> but later on, he turns down a job offer and he chooses to write the story on his own. Like, he's still going to work for them. He's just not going to do it with a team. He's going to be the one man working on his own, doing the whole thing. And as we go on, we find out that Stefan's mother died when he was a child. Uh, it was a train derailment when he was five, and he blames himself and his father for what happened. He kind of blames himself because he's like, oh, well, you know, if I hadn't held her up, yada, yada, yada. But he blames his dad because when Stefan was a child, he had this obsession with this little bunny rabbit toy. 
And his dad was like, well, he shouldn't be playing with dolls or whatever. And it was some stuffed animal or some shit. He's like, he's five. (laughs) His dad was kind of a dick. He was. And he he sneaks into Stefan's room one night and takes the doll and hides it. So then that next morning when Stefan's mother is on her way to work, Stefan refuses to go with her. And because he can't find his doll, he won't leave the house until he can find it. And she gets on the train and then... She, the train gets derailed and she dies. So he is coping with the fact that he feels like his father is responsible for his mother's death. He feels partially responsible himself, but he more puts it off on a day. Mm-hmm. He's going through therapy and, and talking about that. And his therapist is, is trying to help him work through his issues, but it's not really working. I mean, he, we make him kind of open up about it a little bit like us, the audience, through our decisions, but he's still kind of apprehensive about it, and he doesn't really want to, you know, go there, I guess. We then go, and we see that he, Stefan goes out, and he's, like, buying some albums to listen to that Colin has suggested to him, because he asked him, like, what do you listen to when you're writing? And he's like, I don't know, fucking <laughs> Barney. The radio. Right, so you know, fucking <laughs> music, what the fuck? And so he he gives him a list of songs to go out and buy or albums, and we have to make a decision. And I don't remember what the other decision was, but I know we picked Phaedra as the album. I didn't know what either one of them were. Bermuda Triangle was the oh, other yeah. one. Oh, yeah. Now, I, I'm not like a big, super big, Ben might know, 80s music buff, so I don't know if these were actual albums or if it's something that they just made up for the movie. Because they do play real songs throughout the movie from the 80s. I like but... 80s music, but I still had no idea what But do you were. know album names, though? Because no. they didn't say the bands or if anything. They would have said the band, maybe. Yeah, and I was just like, I don't know if either one of these things are actually real. So anybody out there, if you know, is Phaedra or Bermuda Triangle or are those actual albums and who were they by? And do they have any kind of significance behind the names of the albums or anything that relates to the story? I'm curious. But we, we go on, and after he, he's in that store, he finds the, he buys the, um, a book about the author who wrote the Bandersnatch book. And the author, we find out earlier, that actually killed his wife, like he decapitated her and went insane while he was writing the book. I think he, it was after he finished the book or he killed her, then he finished the book or something like that. It was like either that. one of them, but there was a lot of bloody pictures in the book and. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he 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 went like ape shit crazy, and so as Stefan is working on the game, he begins to become more and more distant and agitated. Like he's not sleeping well, he's not really eating all that much, and when he does sleep, he always seems to be startled awake, like he's had a nightmare the night before. And just the the, the way that they set it up up until that point. I was like, it, it was a good little mystery because I'm like, I don't understand what's happening yet. And I was curious to see, like, okay, how is this going to play out? What is the significance of the author and him killing his wife? Like, how is that going to play into the rest of the story? Like, what is it with Colin? Because he seemed like he kind of knew more than he was letting on. But you don't find out anything right away. And, I mean, I up until that point, I was enjoying the movie quite a bit. <laughs> Now, again, I know you did not feel that way. I know you didn't like the repetitiveness and the stopping and starting, but it's just as far as a story goes. I liked it up until, like, the end, kind of. Like, the last, like, maybe ten minutes of the storyline. Of which storyline, though, is, is the thing, because... And, and, I mean, we'll get there, we'll get there, but... Yeah. I, I, I think I felt your frustration the most... When Colin finally breaks the fourth wall and he's like yelling into the sky to us, the audience, he's like, give me a sign. Like, who is this? Like, Mm -hmm. who is doing this to me? And yada, yada, yada. Oh, I was getting mad. I think by that point, it was kind of like your breaking point because we redid that part probably a good four or five times. Mm hmm. It, like, easily. Maybe even six, to be honest with you. I could honestly say that I was starting to get pissed. Like, I was sitting there and I could feel the anger, like, bubbling up in me. <laughs> I'd not want to watch it no more. But is I, I guess I should ask then, so as far as, as our actors, I don't know who plays Stefan, 
But I know the guy Colin. who plays Colin, he is in... We're the Millers. Yeah, he plays a cop in Detroit, and he plays the son in We're the Millers. I looked up his name the other day, but it's escaping me right now. I can't remember what his name is. Anyway, he, he's a pretty good actor. <laughs> he he He's kind of... This is gonna sound horrible. He's kind of weird looking. You know, he has a little, a little weird like look to him. Kind of creepy, to be honest. And I was telling you when we were watching it, I was like, you know, he was actually supposed to play Pennywise in the It movie originally until they recast it and changed the actor, which I still think he would have did a good job. Cause even without makeup, like he's kind of scary looking. Like he looked like he'd fucking kill you in your sleep and shit. Like, yeah, you seem the type that you dress up like a clown and murder kids and shit like that. That's (laughs) horrible. Hey, I didn't write the movie. You blame Stephen King for that shit. Or John Wayne Gacy, one of the two. Anyway, what about the therapist? How'd you feel about her? Mm, She was all right. Mediocre. Mediocre. (laughs) She was a mediocre bitch. I, I mean, I thought... She was okay for the purpose that she served for the movie. I feel like she could have been a better therapist. Now, you don't like her techniques, or you didn't like her as an actress? Both. <laughs> She's like, neither a fucker. <laughs> <laughs> fuck that bitch. In all the ways you can mean that shit. Fuck her. Fuck the character, the actress, her, her fucking practice, all that shit. I didn't, I didn't, like I said, I was kind of indifferent about her. I was like, eh, one way or another, I didn't care. I, I did think that they did a good job with her about being dismissive enough, especially once he starts really getting out there with shit and he's like telling her about like somebody's controlling me mm-hmm. and yada, 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 like her reactions to it. I, I, I did enjoy that. You know what I mean? The actress herself. She was kind of just, meh, she's whatever. It's like, uh, pretty forgettable. Like, uh, I guess. We don't like his dad, though. It's his dad's an asshole. Stefan, Stefan's dad was an asshole, yeah. Yeah. And But you could tell he did love Stefan, and he did care about him. Yeah. But he was kind of a dick. Yeah. You know. He took his son's pet rabbit. <laughs> she said he went on the shit list instantly after that and never came back off it. Like, your son is five. Let him have a toy. Yeah, yeah. Now... While Stefan is working on the game and is starting to really get stressed out, his dad comes to him and he tells him, like, hey, you know, uh, l- l- let's go to the pub and get some lunch or some shit like that. And he's like, no, nah, you know, I'm good. And he's like, oh, come on. Now, we make a decision during that point to take the tea or coffee. I don't know. I want to say it was coffee because tea is usually like almost clear, like regular oh, tea. Brown. Well, it's brown, but it's it, it. Yeah, what he poured on there looked kind of chunky. Yeah, no, not, not chunky. It just looked like it had creamer in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it didn't. It seemed more opaque. But I don't know. Were they in like England? Yes, yes, yes. yes. This so, takes place in like England somewhere. Well, yeah. they drink milk in their tea. So See? there you go. You answered your own question. <laughs> I still like coffee better. But either way, he pours a liquid substance that's not water <laughs> of some kind onto the computer a- as a choice. And we kind of did that one just as a goof because initially he the, – the choices were either pour it on the computer – Because the game's not working, and his dad's like, oh, well, let's go get something to eat, take a break for a while, and he's getting all frustrated. And the choice is either to yell at his dad or pour the drink on the computer. We just thought it would be funny to see what would happen if we pour the drink on the computer, and he does. And then the movie ends again. (laughs) (laughs) I forgot what ending we got that time, though. I don't know. I think it just, I think, I actually, I think it just goes back to that TV screen where it's like replaying what happened, and it's like, do it again. Probably. But we yell at his father and flip out on him and shit, and he's like, you know what, fuck that shit, like, you know, you come with me right now, grab your shit. Yeah, we're going to get some lunch. Yeah, yeah. And Stefan goes to sleep while this is happening. In the car. Yeah, in the car. And his dad ain't shit because Stefan wakes up, and they're at the fucking psychiatrist's uh, office and shit, and he's like... What the fuck is this? He's like, I thought we was going to the pub. He's like, yeah, you know, you've been kind of fucked up lately, so I figured we'd come here and 
see her shrink again. He was like, ain't this a bitch? No trust. Yeah. And so we have a choice that comes up again where we can either, because he sees Colin walking down the street while this is happening. And we have a choice to either go with his dad to see the shrink or to chase after Colin. And we go after Colin. What was crazy about once we run into him and talk to him and shit, and he's like, oh, I'm just having a hard time finishing the game. And, <laughs> you know, I got writer's block or some shit. And he's like, you're in the hole. And so he takes him to his apartment, and Colin introduces Stefan to his wife. And her name's Kitty? I don't I think his remember. wife's name is Kitty. I forget his daughter's name because she's like a baby. And he's like, oh, you know, this is the legacy I'm leaving behind, yada, yada, yada. And he's like, you know, telling his wife, like, oh, you know, Stefan's in the hole. She's like, you're going to help get him out? He's like, yeah, I got him. So they go into his room and. Get high. Right. Colin pulls out this big ass fucking joint and shit and he lights it and he goes to pass it to Stefan. Now, when we're watching this, I'm thinking, oh, okay, we're going to have a choice whether or not to smoke the weed. They don't give you a choice to whether or not to smoke the weed. <laughs> He's just like, oh, well, you know, I haven't done this before. And he's like, motherfucker, you better take this shit. And okay, he didn't say all that. But, no, he should have. But he pretty much, you know, he would not, it. he would not like let his hand go down. Yeah. He's like, you better take this or I'm going to hold it out. Right. He's like, I'm just going to keep holding it here till you take this big ass <laughs> joint. So he does. And Colin hit, or Stefan hits the weed and he's all choking and shit. Then. Colin pulls out these two fucking acid tabs and shit with the uh with the little Bandersnatch lion on it, the Pax monster, the Pax demon, or whatever they call it in the movie. And Amber didn't know what it was. She thought that they were taking ecstasy, and I'm like, no, those are acid tabs. I'm like, I've never taken acid myself, but I know what that shit looked like. And I was like, no, they were totally going to do some fucking acid. Plus, that was popular in the 70s and 80s and shit. People did all kind of hallucinogens and LSD and all that crazy shit. Well, he, because I guess he's trying to, uh, open his mind up to the possibilities and <laughs> the, the horizons and shit. And they gave us a choice whether or not to take the acid, but they never gave us a choice whether or not we wanted to smoke the weed. We chose to take the acid because I was like, I just want to see what the fuck is going to happen because I figured, you know, maybe this will help explain some more stuff in the story and kind of help us understand what's going on. No, just get him high. No, it does. It does. <laughs> it does because Stefan's high as shit. And Seeing colors. Yeah, he's like looking at posters on the wall and all this shit's going on. And then Colin goes into some straight woke conspiracy theory ass shit for your ass. Like he started going, the government is watching you. This and the other. They drug your food and yada, yada, yada. And a lot of the stuff he was saying is true to a degree. Then he started going off into this shit about Pac-Man, and he's like, uh, he was like, oh, do you know what Pac stands for? It's like program, uh, and control. And control. And, which I'm pretty sure that's not what it it's means. It's just at a all. game. It, it, well, it, I think, I think the original Japanese name for Pac-Man is Puck-Man, because Puck means something over there. I don't know what. And they changed it to Pac-Man in the U.S. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm like, I, I think you are just making up shit, Colin, but, but he's talking about how time is a construct and reality isn't what we think it is. And the whole thing with the Pac-Man game is it's about somebody who they live to do nothing but consume and are being chased by these other entities as in the ghost. And then he was like, right when you think you've gotten out the maze, you come right back in on the other side. He was like, people think it's a fun game, but it's a fucking nightmare and yada, yada. <laughs> Like, he, he goes off into some, like, next-level conspiracy theory type shit, and it's actually pretty funny. But he is dropping a little bit of hints of what is happening in the story. You know, whether or not this is all in his head, or if he actually knows more than Stefan does at this point, they leave it kind of ambiguous. Because it seems like, okay, he's just high as hell and he's tripping, but there is a lot of truth to what he's saying as far as it applies to the world that they're in. Yeah. So they go out on his ledge <laughs> and you know, he's like, Oh, you know, none of this shit matters. This and the other. Cause whatever choice I make here, there's another universe where I did something else. Yada, yada. And he's like, somebody's going to go over this edge, whether it will be me or you, blah, 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 blah. And you get another choice <laughs> and you can choose whether to jump or have Stefan jump. Or, I'm sorry. I had Colin jump. I wanted to 
choose Stefan just to see what would happen. And I actually, because after we, because there's no way you can see every possibility through one sitting. You'd have to watch a movie multiple times. Oh, to yeah. Get all the endings. But I did watch a video, and if you choose to have Stefan jump, you see it from his perspective in first person, and you watch yourself oh, fall, no. and then hit the thing and shit, and you die, and then it restarts you again, or it just ends right there, one of the two. But we made Colin jump, <laughs> and he's like, all right, see so you on the other side. He wouldn't, like, not even tripping about the shit, and he just jumps off the ledge, and his wife comes, and she's like, where's Colin? And he was like, this motherfucker, he gone. <laughs> And, and, and she's all freaking out and screaming and shit. And then Stefan turns around and he sees the Pax demon. Mm-hmm. And it's all like, rah, it's like a jump scare and shit. And he wakes up back at the psychiatric hospital again when he was in the car asleep. And I was like, oh, so is that what's happening every time he's waking up? Cause they have these montages while he's working on the game and you keep seeing him wake up. And I'm mm-hmm. like, is that what's happening every time he wakes up like that? Is that he's coming to a different reality or he made a different choice and then time is restarting? I don't know. But there's one important thing that Colin tells him, though, during that is that time is a construct and mirrors allow you to travel through time, Mm -hmm. which becomes important later because later Stefan has a dream that he does go through a mirror and he goes back to the night that his father took the rabbit and he saw where his dad took it and hit it as a child because he goes through the mirror as an adult but he comes out the other end as a baby yeah or not a baby but like a toddler or whatever fuck a five five year old and you know he he sees it but he doesn't actually change anything no we 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 go forward a little bit here and stefan he starts to like remember the other choices that he's made in the past because he remembers the fact that colin jumped but the other people don't know that he's dead or don't acknowledge that he's dead. They think he's on hiatus. Right. It was like, oh, he's always off getting high or some shit somewhere. He'll be back. He's always comes back. And Stefan's like, are we sure? (laughs) (laughs) He's like, um, last I know that motherfucker brains was splattered all over the fucking concrete. But he, he goes to his shrink after, you know, he wakes back up and he, he tells her that he's being controlled by something other than himself. And, She's like, well, are you hearing voices and, you know, all this other kind of shit? Like, she's very skeptical, which Mm -hmm. you would be. Oh, yeah. I mean, if I came home and told you, like, baby, you know, somebody controlling me, like, I fucked about four or five bitches last night at the club. Like, I don't know. (laughs) You'd be like, no. going right to the mental hospital. She's like, no, I'm going to go to this kitchen and cut your dick off these scissors. (laughs) But uh, up until that point. You know what I'm going to say. The scariest part of this whole movie is during that scene where Colin's talking to him. Because you don't remember what happens before they go to the window ledge. And he's like, look at me. And he takes his glasses off. Oh, his eyes go all crazy. Man, that shit scared the shit out of me. I was like, "Uh uh-uh. I was like, I don't like this at all. like the dude, the scary dude from Powderpuff Girls. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, the devil dude? Him? Oh, yeah, him, yeah. His like, eyes hello, looked like Powerpuff that. Girls. Like, yeah. That's exactly what his eyes looked like. That moment, probably more so than anything else that happens in the whole movie, like, freaked me the fuck out. I was like, uh-uh, I don't like that Not shit Not him at all. jumping, nothing. His eyes. Yeah, his eyes were... Because they were already in some weird, like, trippy, kind of hallucinating oh, thing. Oh, yeah. And I was like, so is Stefan tripping, or is he, like, turning into some shit? Because I was starting to think, like, oh, maybe he's the... He's the, uh, the, the, the bumble bus or whatever the fuck. <laughs> but no, I think he was just tripping balls. But yeah, when, when Stefan goes back to, to his job, oh, oh, and during when he's talking to the shrink, she's like, well, here, um, she's like, well, the fact that you're aware that something's off with you, that's a good sign. Like you're not completely fucking crazy. She said, I'm going to prescribe you this medicine. Just take this shit. And, you know, it'll clear it up. Like, whatever. <laughs> like, it's a rash or some shit. She's like, oh, oh, you feel like somebody from, you know, another dimension is controlling your actions and you don't have control over your own decisions? Just take these pills. You'll be fine. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, like, this is some, I'm going to go shoot up my school after this type shit. Like, you might want to take this a bit more serious. Maybe, I don't know, it was the 80s. I don't know. 
Because <laughs> I was just like, yeah, take these Tylenol or whatever the fuck she give him. And I'm just like, that's that's it? Like you Drink some gonna... Pedialyte. You'll be all right. <laughs> some Activia. <laughs> Make you regular. Oh, I should take these iron pills. Like, the fuck? You're like, oh, you'll be fine. You just got iron deficiency. You'll be all right. There's this moment where it tells you to either have Stefan bite his nails or to pull his earlobe. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I wonder what would happen if we'd have chose for him to bite his nails. Later in the movie, when he is stressed out, they do show him biting his nails. And yeah. I'm like, oh, he is a nail biter. Because I said when we chose, I was like, ah, he seems more like an earlobe puller than a nail biter. I, I could have been wrong. I don't know if he would still <laughs> resisted it if we chose the other. But he goes to pull his earlobe and he grabs his hand and like pulls it down. And like, that's the first like outright moment of the movie where you see that okay he knows that he is being controlled like he says it but this is the first time he actually fights back against it he's like nope yeah pretty much he's like fuck you no hell no but um so he goes home he's getting ready to take the medicine and he looks in the mirror and you get another choice you can either take the pills, or I'm sorry, you can no. either flush the pills. Or throw them in the trash. Or you can throw them in the trash. But either option, he wasn't going to take the medicine. No. But I did find out, though, that if we had a went to the shrink the first time and not went after Colin, we would have had a choice to take the medicine. Mm-hmm. And then that would have produced a different ending where the game comes out and... It still doesn't get a out of five stars or whatever, like a five out of five. And it says that, oh, it just feels that the creator was just kind of going through the paces and he had kind of given up and wasn't himself because Mm -hmm. the medicine like dulls his senses and shit. So it kind of takes some of his creativity away. And I was like, okay, I could see that. So that was another possible ending that we diverted from. And that's, like I said, that's the thing that I liked about this was the fact that there are some endings or some scenarios that come up that, depending on what you chose, other people would have never even had the experience of Colin killing himself or not taking the medicine or anything else. So it just depends on what you chose. Mm-hmm. Now, we're going to kind of fast forward through this a little bit here. Um, he gets a cassette tape from Colin's assistant when he goes back to work to turn in the game, and it's... Uh, a documentary about the author who killed himself mm-hmm. or who killed his wife. And he has the, the, the game set up, but it's not working. There's still some bugs in it and shit. And he asked for an extension over the weekend and the developers like, Hey man, you gotta have this shit by Monday. Like we already got advertising put out for this shit. Like this shit's supposed to be coming out like today. So they push it back a few days and he goes home And he's working on it and he's still kind of, you know, frustrated and it's not working the way he wants it to. So he kind of takes a break and puts in the cassette of the documentary that Colin gave him. And it talks about how the author started feeling like somebody was watching him and controlling him. And he didn't have uh, control over his decisions anymore and yada 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 and he felt that his wife was drugging his food <laughs> and all this other shit that's why he ends up killing her mm-hmm. because he was like oh this bitch is you she's know, trying to kill me right or working for the government or some crazy some such shit and when he kills her he starts using her blood to write this glyph and it looks like an upside down field gold post but you find out later that it's actually the decision trees mm-hmm Of the, okay, this thing happens and then it splits off into the brackets and it's like, okay, you can choose this or this. Which is, again, referring to the game that Stefan's working on and the movie itself. Now, we finally get to a point where he can't get the game to work and we try to get him to throw T on the computer again, (laughs) but he won't do it. And no, because the choices were either break the computer or throw T on it. Yeah. And we chose to throw the T on it again. He won't do it this time. He, like, stops himself, and he gets all pissed off, and he's screaming at Sky. He's like, you know, who, uh, wh- who is this? Like, why are you doing this to me? Just give me a sign. Give me a sign. And then we have the choice to pick either the little bracket symbol or Netflix. <laughs> and I, I've, I'm i curious how many people chose Netflix. I really am. Probably 
pretty much everyone. You think so? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm really curious, like, how many people actually chose Netflix. We chose Netflix. And we explained to him that we are from the 21st century and we are controlling what he does for our entertainment. And he's like, I don't understand. And he's like, I'm watching you from a streaming service, this, that, and the other. And he's like, I don't understand. It's like, you know, it's and, – and they try to explain to somebody from the 1980s what a streaming service is from the, you know, 2019. And he's like, I don't even know what any of this even means. No. Like, what are you talking about? And so he goes back to his shrink and he explains to her what happens. And he's like, you know – they, they, they're from the future and they're controlling me and he's trying to explain it to her this and the other. And she's, you know, like doubtful of him. And she, she's basically like, look, you know, if this was for entertainment, like why, why are you in this situation? Like in this room in this, like, this is, if this is supposed to be for entertainment, isn't this kind of boring or whatever? He's like, you know, wouldn't you want something more entertaining? <laughs> and you get another choice of yes and fuck yeah. <laughs> and, or is it hell yeah? Or no, something like that. I thought I said fuck yeah. Yeah. So we picked. Fuck yeah. <laughs> and this motherfucker grabs her mug and throws tea in this bitch face. And he's like, yeah, is that entertaining enough for you, bitch? Or something like that. And she pulls out these Nine like chucks. fighting sticks and shit. Uh-huh. And it becomes like a Kill Bill movie for a good like five minutes. Because you have the choice to either jump out the window or fight her. Mm-hmm. And we was like, fuck that. We finna fight this bitch. <laughs> so it becomes the Matrix for a minute. Like, y'all doing karate and shit. And she throwing you over tables. And motherfuckers kicking and shit. Then a dad bursts through the door. And you fighting him. And he <laughs> he grabs Stefan. And like he's like choking him. And you have the option to like karate chop him. Or kick him in the balls. <laughs> and of course. Kick him in the balls. And he kicks his dad in the nuts. And he goes down. And then the dad starts restraining him and pulling him out. And he's like, yeah, is that enough entertainment for you, bitch? And shit. No, this says he's leaving. But then it goes back. And it's like, okay, you can't. <laughs> like, we can't have you it. You can't act like that. like that. So so the next time we pick the uh, decision tree or the brackets or whatever. Basically, at this point, just about everything we chose, at least for us, we kept getting cycled back to that mm-hmm. moment where he's like, who's doing this? What's going on? Eventually, we finally do get it to where he does go back to the dream, and he goes to his dad's room. He has a safe in there, and we figure out the code, which I think the code we put in was PAC, mm-hmm. like P-A-C, like Pac-Man. And we open up the, the safe, and you find all this paperwork and, like, video footage and shit, and you find out that the dad works for the government. You're a part of that program and control experiment. And, like, everything from your childhood was all on a sound stage, and none of it was real, and they were recording it and shit, and, like, talking about inciting trauma and this, that, and the other. It was just a bunch of crazy shit. Like, yeah. some for real, like, Alex Jones tinfoil hat, like, hardcore conspiracy theory type shit. And so his dad confronts him, and he's like, I know what you've been doing to me, and, and, and I know you've been drugging my food, and you trying to control me. And his dad, like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? Like, you is fucking tripping. And he's like, I'm calling a shrink. He's like, oh, I know that bitch in on it, too, and you've been recording my sessions with her, and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and we have the choice to kill the dad with the fucking ashtray and shit. And I forget. No, we, we don't. We, we don't kill him. We don't, yeah. No. But even though we chose not to kill him, it seemed like Colin st- or Stefan still was going to because he's like holds his own arm down. Yeah. And I was like, so did you want to kill him in that moment and we stopped you from doing it? Or did we stop you from doing it, but it still played out like we were going to tell you to kill him anyway? And apparently you could have killed him in that moment and then I guess chopped his body up and shit. What? And, uh. and buried him in the yard because remember at the very beginning when right before he asked you what kind of cereal you want he's yelling at the dogs for like trying to dig up the road yeah bed. apparently you bury him out there oh wow and and there's a different version where colin comes to the house and you kill colin and you bury him out there <laughs> and either way oh he's fucked up yeah like he ends up going to prison and that's a different ending and it's like a uh I think it's out of 10, actually, instead of five stars. And you get a rating of five out of 10. Like, oh, it was pretty okay, but it doesn't quite work out in the end, yada, yada. And it becomes apparent to me, at least, that those little reviews that he's doing at the end are actually grading how good your ending was. Because when we end it 
at the very beginning of the game when we choose to work for them, it ends like 10 minutes after the movie starts. Mm -hmm. And it's like zero out of 10 stars or five stars or whatever the fuck. And it's like, oh, okay, because that was the worst ending. And then as we got different endings as it progressed, it was like, okay, he's grading how well our decisions were that led us up to this point. Basically, once we get back to... We go back again to him going to the safe, and this time we pick Toy. And he finds the rabbit, puts it back under his bed, and then his mom comes, and she's like, okay, honey, like, you know, do you want to, you know, come on? Yeah, I got to go to work or whatever, and we chose no. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm like, if we go with her, we're going to die. Because her train's going to derail no and matter she's what. she's still going to die. So no matter what, his mom's going to die. Like, yeah. We couldn't change that. We go to the moment where we tell him about Netflix and we go back to the shrink and she's, he's telling her that somebody from the 21st century is controlling him. And she's like, wouldn't this be more entertaining? And he throws a tea in her face again. And this time, instead of fighting her, we chose to jump out the window mm -hmm. and he goes to the window and then the lights come up and they're like, cut, stop. And they're like, Hey, uh, I think his name is Mike. Sound like that. Like the actor. And she's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I, I was going out the window. And she's like, no, in the script right here, it says that you fight her and shit. And, and basically, it's all a part of the movie. Mm -hmm. And that the actor has become too enthralled in his character. And he is believing that he is really Stefan. And that's where our story ended. Like We didn't get any of the other crazy ass endings with him killing everybody and all this other shit. But that's where we ended up at by the end. I wanted to go back and watch it again because I wanted it to play out differently because I didn't, of, of everything that happened, I know you were like, I'm done with this shit. <laughs> but I didn't like that ending. Like, I didn't care for it. Like, I was like, ah. I didn't want it to be like, oh, it was all a movie and he's just uh, going crazy. And I'm like, ah. I didn't like that. Like, I wanted it to be something. I felt very Black Mirror, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I guess of all the endings that we could have chosen, that is one of the better ones because nobody dies in it. <laughs> I mean, now Colin of. still died, but we don't kill his dad. We no. don't kill the shrink. We don't kill Colin. Uh, like I said, cause he pops back up in one of the other endings. Um, even the game developer comes to his house in one ending and he's like, Hey, what's going on with the game? You said you have it done by Monday and we kill him too. So. In ours, nobody dies, but then we don't get any kind of resolution to that story because the movie just ends. Because she's like, oh, I'm going to call a medic and have him come down here and the credits come up. And I was like, oh, I was like, mm. and And they didn't give us a choice to go back, which I was kind of bummed about. Because I was like, well, all the other early endings, y'all was like, do you want to go back and do this different? It's like, you've been watching this for too long. You're done. Right. They was like, motherfucker, we didn't took you back to that who's there moment like six times. Like, if you ain't going to pick nothing more interesting than this than fuck it. But there was a point when we picked toy at the safe, the the other option became from pack to pax like P A X, like the Pax Demon. And I guess if you would have picked that, the demon would have popped out like a jump scare and then you'd have made you do it again anyway. So yeah, I I think the path that we went down we kind of fucked up somewhere, <laughs> but I was like, I didn't know what else to do at that point. Cause I was like, I don't know. They keep taking us back to this Netflix moment. And I'm like, I don't, is that not what you want me to pick? <laughs> all in all, the story itself, I enjoyed it because it becomes so meta and because the character becomes self-aware that you are controlling him and that we can directly communicate with him. I thought that was the best part of it. Everything else. It was kind of just like, nah. you know, it was, it was a fun little mystery, but Hell, I like the the political episode where the dude, the comedian, has the little uh, digital thing that runs for, like, parliament and shit in Britain, and then people actually vote for it, and he wins oh, and yeah. shit. I like that episode better than I like this, so... Or, or the one where they're all riding the bicycles of slaves and shit, and the one girl gets put into, like, the American Idol show thing, mm -hmm. and then the one guy goes on there, he's threatening to kill himself with the glass, but then he ends up getting the show threatening to kill himself every episode. Like I like those episodes more because I felt like they had something to say this. I was like, I don't know what this by the end. I'm like, I don't know what this was supposed to be saying about anything. Like it doesn't have a message. Right. Reality doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> the choices you make don't matter. Like fate is forever. Like, I don't, Just I don't know. Do acid. Pretty much. That, that's what you got from like, get high as hell. 
I don't know. I, I did, uh, like I said, Amber didn't care for this at all. I did like it, but it could have been better. It could have been a lot better. Like I said, I feel like if it was just a flat out story and it wasn't the interactive thing, you wouldn't have had such a problem with it. Maybe not. I still probably wouldn't have liked it, but it would have made it a little better. We have a five tier rating system. Really fucking liked it. Liked it. Meh. Hated it and really fucking hated it. Of the five, Amber, what would you give Black Mirror Bumblebus or whatever? Bandersnatch. Really fucking hated it. Damn! A really fucking hated it? I would never it? watch it again. Wow. Really? You couldn't pay me to watch it. Wow. Really? Really. It was not that bad. I did not care for it. God damn. Really? Really. Wow. Okay. Use your line on my mama. I would never watch it. <laughs> I, I, look, I, I don't agree with you <laughs> at all. I, I don't think it was that bad. I think it was meh at best. Or at worst, I would say <laughs> meh. Like, at best, I'm at a liked it. I'm, I'm kind of more closer to meh. Like, eh, it was okay. Like, like, they, they allude to the fact that there's a bigger message that they're trying to give, but they never get around to saying it. And I'm just like, okay, I don't know what I'm supposed to take away from this. No. So, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm going to stick with meh. I, I can't quite go liked it. I was never bored by it, but all of my entertainment came from the fact of just seeing, okay, what's going to happen when I choose mm-hmm. this? Because I remember at the very beginning, I was like, I wonder if we just keep picking yes to for the job offer. Like, what happens if we do the same thing again, even though that's not what they want us to do? Like he just looks at the camera and be like, "What? No, motherfucker! Like, stop picking that shit." <laughs> Clearly, that is not what the TV just shuts down. Right? Netflix just uninstalls and shit. TV just catch on fire, or I should say, the PlayStation because we couldn't actually watch it on our TV. No, we no. have a dumb TV. It's supposed to be a smart TV, but it ain't that smart. It's the dumbest thing out there. Well, it's not <laughs> bad. I mean, it's a decent sized TV. It does have some smart TV capabilities, but it's an older it model. It shuts off on me. No one cares about this. I'm, I'm like, we're going off in our fucking TV problems. You I'm brought like, oh, it up. Shit. All that being said, though, I think if you do have an afternoon, it's only about an hour and a half, uh, maybe longer. Give or take. Yeah, maybe longer, depending on what decisions you make and how many times you have to restart, but... I think if you got an afternoon and you don't have a whole lot to do, it's, it's something fun to do. Like, if you like, if you're into interactive content, I think you'll appreciate this. As a story itself, it's not all that great, but if you have fun with making decisions and seeing how your decisions play out, I think you'll enjoy this. If you're more like Amber and you don't like that kind of shit, then... Don't watch it. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I disagree with you, like, wholeheartedly. I'm like, it's not that fucking bad. Even if you took the interactive shit out of it, it ain't that bad. It kept me interested enough. She's like, fuck you. <laughs> I know. I'm just sitting here like, no. Yeah, that's it for uh, Black Mirror. Russell Scott. Yeah. Right. Russell Sprout. We are going to go ahead and leave you guys, but this is our first of our two-part special vacation episode review uh, (laughs) this week. So if you're hearing this, we're already down in good old Austin, but we wanted to make sure that we had something ready for you guys. So yeah, something to listen to. Plus, we we figured we'd catch up on some of the things on Netflix that we haven't seen yet. Thanks for sitting here and doing this with me again. Amber, tell the people bye. Bye. One Giant Leap for Geeks proudly presents Talking With. This week we have a special guest, Zane Shinwari, who was gracious enough to join us today. We're glad to have you on the show, Zane. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Why don't you go ahead and tell the people a bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, like you mentioned, my name is Zane, and I've started a comic book uh, publishing company called Inzane Comics. Um, and uh, I've been doing this for, started my first comic story about two years ago and uh, started the publication about a, 
you know, about a year ago or so. And I've actually quit my corporate job to pursue this full time. Yeah, I'm one of those crazy ones. That's like why I call myself insane. Wow. Yep. So that's okay. a, little, yeah, a little spiel about myself. Now, before we actually get into the actual interview, as you know, the Internet is a place of absolutes. You're either the best thing ever or you're the worst thing ever. So, so before we get started, we need to place you into some kind of stereotype. So I got some questions for you. Okay. All right. You ready? Yes. Okay. So first, Batman or Superman? Oh, I personally liked uh, Superman. Superman has been my favorite. Uh, reasons? So Superman was more, it kind of happened uh, later in my life uh, just because, you know, it's this, you know, this guy who's, you know, uh, invincible, but his, his biggest vulnerability is his, uh, his uh, morality because, you know, he, I mean, if you think about it, he lives in a cardboard box. Everything is so fragile around him and him being so careful. And, you know, to me, that's just, that's, it's a very interesting way that they've developed Superman. So. Um, there's more depth to that character, in my opinion. Interesting, interesting. Now, I, I like that. I like that um, explanation too, because I'm, I'm, I think just because of my childhood growing up with the uh, Batman animated series, I'm more partial to Batman, and you know, '89 mm -hmm. Batman and Batman Returns and all that. Like, I have more exposure to Batman, but I do think that. Superman can be a more complex character. They haven't really seen to struck that in the movies yet. Per no, se. They haven't. but as far as like in, you know, some of his comic runs, like, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the injustice run or, um, Superman red sun or any of those, like those are like really good stories. Right. But for whatever reason, they just can't seem to get him right in the movies. And I'm just like, you know, People say it's hard to write for Superman, but I just don't think they're coming at it from the right angle. Well, I mean, if you think about it from the movie, I mean, I like Man of Steel. Um, I think yeah, yeah, it's after, okay. Yeah. After that, I feel like each one just kind of started falling down. Yeah. Um, like w with Justice League, I mean, if you think about it, Superman came, beat the villain in like two minutes, and then he left. And I I'm like, what was the point of the entire Justice League? Why don't you just have Superman? Forget everybody else. You know, it's just... <clears throat> Exactly. It was kind of irritating because, you know, there was no conflict in that sense. And, uh, I don't yeah, know. They, they just I'm made him into the, uh, uh, deus ex machina. You know, he's just like the hand of God. He just comes in, fixes everything, and then he's just done. And it's like, well, he's not really a character anymore. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's just, and I, and I think that's why I like Superman too, because of, uh, y you know, that where it could go and because it's, you know, so easily you can you can do it wrong and make it seem like make him into this very uh stagnant character that oh he's just so powerful and just a rock will make him weak you know but mm -hmm. I, I like the storylines where they show that there's gamma rays with the you know with the kryptonite and and it impacts humans as well oh but, yeah yeah so but it just impacts us slower than it does to superman so i like those concepts i'm actually writing my own superman story just in case in the future if i ever work for dc but i, I start writing a superman story myself nice nice and, well hey and the, and the premise is basically about about why does superman look like us if he's an alien oh that could be interesting yeah so that's what my story basically is about and kind of goes into that well, I was like, you don't want to give away too much because somebody's exactly. gonna hear this. And you never know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right? I was like, I'm stealing that idea. Yeah. All right. So uh, for the next question, we got FPS or fighting games. What FPS? I'm not sure. first person shooter. Yes. Um, yes. Well, I think I know your answer now from that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. No. I actually I, I didn't realize this, but I prefer first person shooter. Really? I'm thinking. I felt like it was. Yeah. Yeah. I prefer that. Over fighting so, games, when we're talking about fighting games, we're talking about like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat. Sure, you know, um, Tekken, anything along those lines. Yeah, that any of that would work. Yeah, I think I'm more of a shooter game because I, I was never really good with the combinations and stuff. I was. Oh, uh, you're not a big like up that. down, up down, left right B A person. <laughs> no, and I actually I had some bad experiences as a kid. Um, I, I was one, you know, remember arcades, and. Mm. And so I went to an arcade and I was playing and then I kept on losing. So this kid was like, Hey, if you want to win, you know, let me play. So then he ended up playing on my quarters and, uh, 
I thought about it later. I was like, man, this guy made a fool out of me. <laughs> <laughs> like, I basically played, paid for him to beat the game. That's, that's yeah, great. exactly. It's like, yeah, I had a fun time. So, so of of first person shooters, like which which franchise would you say is your favorite? Like, are you more of a like Call of Duty, Halo guy, like uh, Battlefield? Call of Duty. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's that that one's pretty pretty common amongst most people who like FPS is, is usually Call of Duty. Yeah. Like lately but, I've been getting a lot of people who have been saying stuff like, oh, I like, well, Fortnite's not really a first person shooter per se. It is a shooter, but not first person, but still I've been getting a lot of that lately. What do you call that? What is that called? Third person? Uh, I guess over the shoulder shooter, I guess. Oh, over shoulder. Yeah. To be honest with you, the, I like those better. Uh, yeah. Cause you know, the games that I would typically play would be like Spider-Man and Batman, and they're kind of formatted in, in that kind of way where it's over your shoulder. Yeah. And over the shoulder. And then, um, I'm forgetting the, oh, geez, I'm forgetting one of my favorite games. I can't believe it. Um, but anyways, yeah, those are the kind of games that I like. Yeah, like open world, sandbox. Oh, I yeah. love open yeah. world games. Yeah, I love those. Oh, yeah. Okay, next up, MCU or DCEU? Uh, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but DCU all the way. <laughs> I am shocked, especially after your comments about Superman earlier. So, go ahead, explain, <laughs> explain. I got to hear this. What's that? Sorry? Explain, explain. I, I got I to hear your explanations behind this. Um. Okay, so, you know... When I was younger, uh, Marvel all the way. I, I loved Marvel uh, comics and whatnot. And uh, as I started growing older, DC kind of just I kind of it kind of resonated with me more. It felt more diverse. I felt like Marvel comics were a lot of bit. A lot of them were just mutants, uh, you know, genetically modified somehow. And then, but whereas in Marvel, you got you got like these space cops, and then you have alien, and then you have a you know a billionaire who you know is dealing with his own issues. And, and then not only that, that each character then was like really uh, brought into a emotional uh, spectrum, you know, um, for example, like Batman was not just a billionaire anymore, but now it's him dealing with his, uh, you know, depression or whatnot, his issues of, of the loss of his parents and f channeling it somewhere, you know, and I kind of already mentioned about Superman and, Mm -hmm. uh just you know like they're more they're not they're they're they've kind of moved away from just the bad guy versus the good guy but it's the good guy versus himself you know his own internal struggles and it's just uh it just feels more uh relatable or grounded in that sense and and, and to kind of like you know basically some it, it also has this like darker tone that you know people talk about that i i just actually enjoy it just because it it's uh and it, which is interesting because, um, you know, Marvel started doing that for their Netflix series with Daredevil and Punisher mm -hmm. and whatnot. So mm -hmm. I actually really like those. Now, I <clears throat> now, now I'm not going to shit on you, but I'm going to kind of shit on you. <laughs> um, OK, <laughs> I, I, I understand. I understand your position as far as the ideals of what these characters are and what their foundations are and where they've come from. Yeah. But I don't feel that that's what these characters are in their current movie iterations. No, that's what they should be, but exactly. that's not really what they've been going for. Because I mean, I, cause you know, you could kind of make the same argument that, you know, Marvel has done basically what the DC characters were in their comic forms and movie form. Like, you know, you have Iron Man who's the billionaire who has his own internal struggles and he deals with alcoholism and, you know, anxiety and stuff like that. And then you have, you know, kind of with the Guardians of the Galaxy and probably a little bit more with Captain Marvel, the whole like space cop police force and stuff like that. It, it's 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 not that I don't like DC characters. I just don't like the DCEU. Like, I mean, the 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 honestly, if they had the right people behind it, I think that the DCEU could easily overtake what Marvel has done. I mean, they would need time to, yeah. to build up to that, but. I just don't feel like the people who are running it understand what these characters are. And I was kind of excited when Jeff Johns got brought on, but they don't really seem to really let him really do much. And yeah. now he's kind of splintered off into his own little thing. So I, I don't I don't really have a lot of hope that they're going to be able to ever turn this ship around. You know, to me, when I watch these DC movies, I feel like they're going through like an identity crisis. It's like, oh, yeah. 
they can't make up, you know, their mind on what they're doing. And they just have to, I mean, they got to look back at the comic books that there was a successful, you don't have to please everyone. No, no. Uh, just, but at the same time, I would argue that it depends on which comics you're looking at, because it's like they can't keep trying to make the Dark Knight Returns over and yeah. over again and try to make everything like that. Because yeah. I think the big problem is, is because the Dark Knight franchise was so good, they keep trying to make everything like that. And it's yeah. like Superman is not Batman and you can't make a new Batman and try to make him like the Dark Knight Batman. Like they don't work together in the same context that they would in the comic books. Right. Like in the comics, it's, it's different. Like if you're going to make a movie franchise, people complain that Marvel movies are formulaic, but I think that you it need works. to, yeah, I'm like, there has to be some kind of, you know, steady level playing ground for these people to interact with, because that's why it's okay that we have a tree talking to Iron Man and, you know, a big purple alien, you know, fighting, you know, Black Widow. It's like, you know, you can make these things work in the same universe because all the characters are just enough kind of alike, mm -hmm. you know, to where it makes sense. But the Batman and Superman that they've created and the Aquaman and Cyborg, they're so drastically different. They don't really gel together. And they didn't allow us to let them gel together because you immediately brought them all together and, you know, we're not familiar with them. And now you're no. trying to make them merge. We've had years to, you know, watch Iron Man or watch these guys grow as characters yep. and then to interact. So we have a lot of background uh, as we're watching. And you know, what's interesting too. And, you know, I mean, I don't know, they could have like tried to make it, you know, you know, if you watch a Marvel movie somewhere, you know, in the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you forget you're watching a movie. You're just engaged in the story. You know, nothing is bothering you. Oh, yeah. And then when you watch, like, you know, I, you know, a lot of people, like Aquaman was pretty successful. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed like they followed the Marvel uh, formula. Oh, I've it heard a lot like, of people compare it to, like, Black Panther underwater. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then, you know, for me, to be honest with you, it, it just didn't really cut it for me entirely mm -hmm. um, because I was watching it. And I felt like I was watching three different movies. Yeah. Fun, and it was mainly the, you know, from the director, I felt like I was watching Fast and Furious and I felt like I was watching a horror movie at one point and, mm. uh, so different aspects of it. Um, but I don't know. It, you know, like the premises behind a lot of these are interesting, like in Suicide Squad. I actually kind of like what they did with Joker from a concept standpoint of making him this like, uh, gangster, you know, something fresh. Sure. It felt sure. fresh. But they, they barely showed him and, and they could have made the story like what would have been really interesting was to kind of uh, put this weird uh, romantic uh, romance between uh, the Joker and Harley Quinn as kind of like the, a major part in the story. And I would have been interested in that, to be honest with you, you know, just to see that weird dynamic happen. And it was just, you know, I think in, in all, we probably saw Joker for like 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. All. Yeah, no, yeah. to be honest, the Joker should have been the antagonist of that movie and yeah. not, you know, what, what was her name? God, who, who would you end up, uh, yeah, the villain? witch ladies? Whatever. Yeah, 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 I can't think of her name right now, but yeah, yeah. exactly why she should have been there. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I mean, she, you know, they made him such an ancillary, you know, like, um, you know, character that he's kind of like, well, we'll cut to him every now and then and just, you know, see what he's doing. But I'm like, he should have been the villain. Of the movie and the Suicide yeah. Squad should have been going after the Joker. Plus, I, I kind of agree with with your whole the concept of trying to you know make him like a modernized like kind of thug like cholo Joker. Like I'm okay mm -hmm. with that to a degree. Yeah. I just think the execution was off. Yeah. And then as well, I just think Jared Leto had really bad direction. It's like like at some point David Ayer should have came in there and be like, okay, we need to pull this back a little bit. Like you're going a little bit too far out there, and it's like it's it's not. It's right. not coming across as scary or, you know, meticulous. You just seem weird. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's going to be – it's an interesting challenge for these guys, and that, I think that applies to Marvel too. I mean, you have these characters. Um, I mean, how many times are you going to redefine it, you know? Um, right, true. You, you know, how many times – and you got to come up with something fresh. You know, like when, uh, the Mar when Marvel came and introduced Spider-Man and Homecoming, I actually like the fact that – you know, they skipped the whole spider biting the hand and, you know, us like seeing how he develops into Spider-Man. I, I kind of like it. You, you didn't want to see Uncle Ben get shot again? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, it's for a third I like, time. I like, I like origin stories, but I mean, we've seen, and especially Spider Man has just changed too many times. Yeah, but I, I would make that same argument for Batman, though. It seems like they cannot make a Batman movie without showing his parents getting killed. And it's like, okay, we get yeah. it. They even did it in BVS, and I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like, it's not even his movie, and you're still showing the origin story of Batman. Like, yeah. we know who Batman is. We, we don't need to see that anymore. Yeah. But but that being said, though, um, I got one more for you. Um, no, this one's kind of a curveball. Uh, Pokemon or Digimon? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I'll have to lean towards Pokemon. Really? Okay. Because my wife loves Poke. She loves Pikachu. Ah, uh, yeah. You you guys excited for Detective Pikachu? Um, n- no, not really. Because it's really weird to see Ryan Reynolds play Pikachu. You know, because you we have always imagined Pikachu as that cute little voice. Oh yeah. And just to see that is just it's kind of hard to let it settle in, you know. But. I mean, we'll still watch it, you know. Oh, sure, you know, we'll yeah. give it a chance. We just, you know, it just felt a little weird. I, I, I actually am the opposite. Like, I had no interest in it because I knew it was in development, and I, I think I even knew that Ryan Reynolds might be voicing Pikachu. But even knowing that, I was like, oh, I'm not really interested in seeing it. But once I actually saw the trailer, I was like, oh, okay, I see what you're going for here. Like, now I'm actually interested because I'm. Mm. I was definitely more of a Digimon person. Like, I collected Pokemon cards as a kid, and I played the games when I was young. But, you know, Digimon, I was much more into more so just the show, not so much like the other, like, you know, accessory stuff to the show, like the actual games and stuff. But I I like the concept of Digimon more, of having, you know, the whole digital world and all that stuff. I was like, this is cool, as opposed to... Hey, there's just this weird earth where animals, you know, are put in captivity and we make them fight each other like pit bulls or something. <laughs> Fair enough. So now we're going to get to the actual interview questions. Now that okay. we've, we've rambled it long enough. Um, okay. so what made you want to start writing comics? Um, I've actually, uh, written stories before and, um, you know, I've, I've enjoyed the medium of comic books because, uh, you, know, you can, because first of all, I mean, I could write things as just as a novel, but I'm a very vis- I'm a visual person. Sure. And so, you know, for me, that's, I guess, the audience I also look for uh, is to be able to portray that. And I love art. You know, I draw and sketch myself. So uh, just the combination of those just really pushed me towards going, com- you know, writing a comic book. Um, technically, the stories that I write, they're kind of more so formatted um, like a graphic novel. Uh, in a sense, um, but uh, I'm merging the two the two mediums, and you know it's it's the it's the best way to, uh, in my opinion, to represent more economic than making a TV show, and you know, uh, best way to represent a uh, story. Okay, okay. <clears throat> now, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to like aspiring? you know, either comic writers or writers in general or people who are just looking to start their own, like, you know, indie publishing, like what, what would kind of advice would you give them? Um, the first advice I'll give is don't force it. Um, if you're with a story, I know this is going to sound kind of cliche, but just let it come to you. Um, one of the things that I do before writing a story, um, is I just really expose myself. Like, I, first of all, I don't cap myself and think I'm writing a story. I, I really open my mind and I read a lot of uh, things about history and science and stuff. And then something clicks and I'm like, oh, this would be cool. And I start writing these concepts down. They're not a story. They're just concepts. Um, and I write those down. And, and that's another thing I advise. Whenever you come up with a cool idea, don't think you'll remember it later. Write it down. Like, I use Google Docs. I mean, because then whenever I'll, like, jot it down on my notes and then I'll transfer it to my Google Docs so I always have it and so then when I start actually sit down and write my story um, I have all these bullet points of these cool ideas I came up with Um, so that's one of the uh, advice that I'll give and then for writing um, you know I I deal I mean every writer kind of deals with some writer block a little bit oh sure so my best advice for those who are writing first of all whatever scene you're writing uh, if it's a uh, epic scene or if, you know, it's a war scene, listen to war music, you know, something that sounds like that. Or if you're making a romantic scene, listen to romantic music. It helps me. I don't know. Everyone's different, but it it's one of those things that helps me. And then 
I, and then when I'm writing, I don't focus on what I'm writing. I'm imagining the story and I'm like, as, but then I'm just commentating what I'm imagining, you know? So when I'm, when I look later on, I mean, some of it makes sense, some of it doesn't, but that's when you do your revision, but that's the best way I overcome uh, writer's block. Just kind of like a, a free, you know, flow of thought of consciousness okay. until you pick out something that you want to actually expound upon. I, I, I like that. Cause I, <clears throat> that's the first I've heard of someone like, you know, using like, um, genre or thematic music of what they're trying to write to kind of help get the creative juices flowing. But once you said it, I was like, you know what? That's kind of really ingenious. Like I would have never thought of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, cause a lot of the times when I come up with stories, it'd be like, I'd be listening to some music, you know, or watching, I would watch like a music video, um, scene or something. There's, there, so there's one story that I'm writing called game plan. And, um, I, it kind of came up from when I was, I was watching this, uh, music video for a Bollywood, uh, song. Okay. And, and it was like the way they made it so colorful. And then right after that on my soundtrack, there was a, like an American song and it was just so, the contrast was so different. Like, um, what, what they had in the Bollywood music with all this colorful colors and this and that. And then, you know, it changed to the American music and it was like the different kind of tone. And I was like, it's so interesting how cultures are so different. And then I was like, oh, this would make an interesting story, a clash, like not a clash, but like a, a, uh, merge of two cultures. That's, that's something different and unique. And then, so I turned that into a story. Interesting. Um, yeah. So yeah, I get, I get inspired by music. I mean, different kind of things inspire me, but music's were definitely one of those things that, that kind of gets those creative juices flowing. Okay. Okay. Now, Elemental Balance, would this be your first official title? It's my first official comic book title, yes. Okay, okay. So so for Elemental Balance, we have our protagonist, Chloe, who has the elemental power of water manipulation. And she meets with another character, um, am I saying this right, Baraka? Yes, correct, yeah. His power is, from what I can tell, kind of like earth manipulation. Right. Tell us a little bit about them. Like, you know, without spoiling anything, you know, just tell us a little bit about their characters. Um, yeah, so Chloe, she's a, um, she was originally a med, she's a medical student and we find out in chapter two, you know, we, we get a little bit more history about her and, uh, you know, who she is and what happened to her. Um, but she by nature is very inquisitive. Um, she doesn't want to settle with, okay, she got these powers and she, she wants to find out why she got these powers. Um, you know, it's, you know, so, like, it's like an innate thing that some people have, like, what is my purpose? So that's how she treats it. Um, Baraka is more like a person who's more of like a realist. He kind of wants to avoid getting into trouble. He just, he rather like ignore that he has these powers and just live on with life. And so it's these two characters who meet each other. And so then Chloe, basically her, what she's trying to convince to Baraka is that if we we got these powers, there's got to be a reason. Like we shouldn't just ignore it. We should try to find out because uh, you know it'll, it'll have us more, it'll have us better prepared. So she's in the belief to to find out why this happened to them, and that's why they start chasing um, each other. And she, you know, based on the story, she she could have let it go, but she gets this dream that she finds out that connects her to Baraka, and then Baraka has a dream that connects us to the wind elemental. Um, and so they're, they're connected. So, uh, so that's kind of how, or why they start driving that way. And, but the story develops and turns into something different. We find that out after chapter three of exactly, um, what's going on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because so far I've only been able to read chapter one. So I, I haven't gotten into, uh, Chloe's backstory yet and just finding out Baraka and his room about the wind element. So that, that's news to me. So yeah, that, I'm, that, I'm, I'm, gets, that gets revealed in chapter two. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm interested to see where this ends up going. And now, as far as like the art in this book, um, it's by Luke Horseman. Correct. Yeah. Okay. It, it, he has a very distinct, it's kind of like a slightly abstract kind of punk feel to the art. Like, was yeah. there any specific design, like, criteria or elements that you were going for when you um, were kind of explaining to him what you wanted to see? And if so, like, what was the thought process behind it? I, to be honest with you, I saw his art. I, 
you know, for me, when I look at, when I look for an artist, I try not to let them, like, I don't make them deviate from their style. Mm -hmm. I just try to see if the story feels like it connects. And, you know, I'm kind of weird about these things, but like my story feels like a very serious tone story. And so I kind of like that contrast of something that feels more cartoony. Mm -hmm. And to me, I like art that's distinct. Sometimes, you know, there's really good artists out there, but they sometimes feel like that, like they're all copying Jim Lee, which don't get me wrong. I mean, that's great art. I love that art, but mm -hmm. I just wanted something different, you know, something that just kind of like feels different. I, no, I, I, I really liked it because it really stood out. Like it, it almost kind of gave the story kind of, hmm, what's the best way to describe it? Almost like this kind of, ethereal plane almost kind of like dreamscape feel to it yeah. because it's it's especially like the the way that he does just like like the the movements of the characters and just kind of how it, it's slightly over exaggerated but enough to where it's artistic and and i really i was really like taken aback especially like during the mudslide scene in the book like without trying to spoil too much for anyone who hasn't read it yet i, I was really like oh this is really cool like i like the way this is set up because it was like you know it was a vision or a dream of something that actually was taking place but the, i think the art style really lended itself to that yeah yeah and, and it's fun you know like it, it, to me also in the process, like I want to, he's, he's an artist in the UK and it's one of those things that I want to use this, you know, making these comics as an opportunity to bring artists, like, you know, instead of trying to get the most popular artists and use their users, you know, use their fan base to sell my comics, I figured why not use this as a platform to introduce new artists. Um, you know, that, to me, I actually almost call my company Zenison because I wanted it to be the renaissance of art, um, oh, to just kind of okay. bring art back. Um, and so that's kind of what, you know, I, I hope that through my journey into making comics that I kind of keep that in mind that, you know, uh, why I even began doing this is, you know, because I enjoy art and I want to elevate other people who enjoy art and bring their artwork uh, to a platform, you know? So, uh, that's kind of that's kind of where my thought process is in the whole thing, and, you know, as I'm as I'm working on it. But yeah. Okay. So the title of the first chapter is uh, "Groundbreaking News," yeah. and then chapter two is "Water Under the Bridge." So can we uh -huh. expect each title to be related to some kind of idiom or like play on a popular <laughs> phrase? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a sucker to these uh, kind of puns and whatnot. Um, yeah, groundbreaking news, obviously, because we introduced the uh, Earth Elemental and actually we find out, you know, from the news and it has this reference to this, what the main story of that chapter is. In chapter two, water under the bridge, you know, as the idiom means, it's like we're talking about, you know, it's in the past. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about Chloe's past in chapter two. And so it also it plays with words. So it's a little play on words. And then chapter three, up in the air, like, you know, up in the air, we're, you know, it's, we're not certain with what the idiom means. And so that's what is in chapter three. There's some things that, you know, that there's uncertainty. And then we find out the end of this, this climax of some of, of a new news that we hadn't known about. So I try to play with these words a little bit. And then chapter four is called Fired Up. And it's okay. based on this character. You'll find out more. I'm almost keeping the the fourth character, the fire elemental, kind of in, in suspenseful, like so you don't know too much about who this character is. Mm -hmm. And you find that out pretty soon, like why we do this. It's it's mainly for the character development. It's important that we don't know who this character is because then when we find out and when this person is revealed, um, there was an entire character development that that helps till the end of to the end of the story, series and a lot of this stuff it's kind of hard because it doesn't make sense right now mm -hmm. but it'll all come together towards the end and what i'm hoping and what i'm gonna what i know because i've actually read the entire story to my siblings mm -hmm. and it's funny because every time i'm reading like part of the story they're like well why didn't they do that or why didn't that happen and then you find out like sooner or later and then you kind of find out but it's a struggle because by the time you re read end of chapter three you're like well why didn't that happen you're like you gotta wait till chapter four 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's like it, it's leading, it's building to something, but you know, it, without you know knowing the yeah the whole story, yeah, there's kind of like logical gaps where you're like, well, if this happened, then why didn't this character do this? And yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so are you worried that you will eventually run out of <laughs> of uh, little play on words to use for each chapter? No, because I've already written the entire series. It's oh, okay. Six, yeah, it's a, it's going to be like about a seven or eight comic book series, depending on how much I extend a for for like certain scenes. Okay. Um, so the story is entirely written. I already have the play of words for each chapter. Okay. For me, I don't like. I want to make complete stories rather than like ongoing stories, mm-hmm. um, just so that you have a beginning and you have an end. You know, at least like I have it all planned out. Because a lot of like you, what you're gonna find out after you, there's gonna be a one, there's gonna be one chapter you read. I think it's. I gotta look back in my notes, but I don't know if it's the fifth one or the sixth one. And when you read it, you're gonna be forced to read chapter one again. Oh, okay, okay. It's gonna be one of those. Okay. Yeah. So you're gonna, and then you're gonna be like, oh, I missed that. And then you, and then I think on the last chapter, you're gonna read chapter two again. Um, so there's different things that happen. So certain things that seem like they're meaningless or kind of seem stupid, like like why did why was this mentioned? It comes back. Okay. Um, so I try to make it a kind of make it a full circle. So because here's the thing with comic books are it's not like a movie where you watch it and now it's gone. You can flip through pages. You know you can really quickly go to different you know pages. So that so I wanted to take advantage of that it, by doing by making the story fully complete and having traces of important story elements that are that that happened since the beginning. Those are actually some of my favorite stories in really any medium where you can jump back and forth between, you know, the, the, the story and, and go back and go like, I planted seeds for this and now they're coming to fruition later. So you'll end up going back and going like, Oh, okay. Now I see, you know, why such and such did this thing or why they were so vague about this before because it was, actually a part of a overall plot that we hadn't got to yet like so i I enjoy stuff like that yeah and you know i did like i did a little mini version of that in chapter in in chapter one you get a little taste of it because in the very beginning you see this uh epic uh cruise ship and Mm -hmm. you you know you see this uh, disaster scene and and you and i just kind of leave it off right there and some people might have guessed it some people i don't know but then towards the end you kind of find out okay i kind of see why there was this right, there was a point to that at the beginning. Yeah. It just yeah. wasn't this just left on this like kind of loose thread that there, that this has meaning to the overall story. We just haven't got yeah. there yet. And actually chapter two starts off from the cruise ship. Oh, like, nice. The beginning of what happens in the cruise ship. Okay. That's where, that's, that's where it starts from. So it's like a little bit of also time lapses. We kind of jump back and forth where champ, where chapter three ends you know, the scene that it ends in chapter four, we jump back a little bit, a few days. So I kind of like do this a little bit of time jumping as well to get you a full understanding of what's happening in this duration of time. So yeah, we, you know, it, it was, it was fun to do this. I mean, cause I enjoy movies and stories when I watch like that do that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the inspiration that I have is like from TV shows like Heroes. Mainly like the first. Season. You know, I was going to ask if either that or Sense Eight had any kind of influence or on, on your story. Yeah, because it both gave me that feel, especially with these characters who are in like different parts of the world and they're all connected by you know these different events and trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean? Is there a reason behind this? Because that that is actually one of my other questions there seems to be like a catalyst to the characters getting their powers like is there something that is causing these natural disasters or is this just happenstance now if it's a spoiler don't worry you don't have to answer it okay okay because i was curious yeah but you know you'll find it out you'll find out what it is you you kind of find it out in chapter 30 okay we don't blatantly say it but you could probably make out it's what it is in chapter three and then in chapter four i mean sorry in chapter five we basically, basically blatantly say what was happening. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, I was definitely inspired by Sense Eight. You know, there's, you know, I, I think it was such a good show, and in, in the way I thought it was so cool how they uh, showed that they can use each other's uh, abilities. You know, when they would. Have you watched Sense Eight? Oh yes. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so I, I thought those were such cool concepts. And then uh, Heroes had something similar, like their dream dream sequence mm-hmm. with Peter Petrelli. And, you know, you, you thought you were thinking one thing about Peter, and then it turns out something different. Like you thought we thought he was just a normal guy. Then we think, oh, he his one of his powers is he can, you know, dream about things. And then we find out later on, you know, what you know, who actually Peter is, and I don't want to say anything if anybody wants to watch it, but Yeah, right. Like don't want to spoil that like ten year old T V show. But still, hey, if you want to go back and watch it. <laughs> well, you know it's funny though, because I actually really enjoyed that show and I I think that that show kind of set the foundation for people to accept the uh, MCU, the whole like shared universe, because each character kind of had their own little mini series within the show, but then they were still an overall story that connected everybody else. And I think that that kind of opened up people's eyes to the idea of like, yeah, you can have multiple, you know, little franchises that are part of an overarching franchise and they all come together, you know, like annually or whatever and, you know, have their whole thing together. And, and you know what's interesting that you bring that up? I'm doing something similar to that. Okay. Um, so I'm actually connecting all my stories in small ways. And then eventually they'll be, because uh, I have basically a 10 year plan of comic stories. Nice. Um, so, so I have this elemental balance. Then I have the lost king, human animal instincts. So they all connect and there's the ultimate goal that happens towards the end kind of like the Thanos situation, but it's not Thanos. It's something different. Sure. Uh, inspired by actually the science fiction documentary that I watched. So that's an ultimate goal that happens and everything leads towards it. And it's the, the stories are independent. You can read them on their own and you won't have to worry about any, you know, connecting them. But if you do read the other stories, you'll find like these nice Easter eggs and like, ah, that was there. That was there. Cause in fact, and in fact, there's in one scene in chapter three, all the characters are trying to find the wind element. So, so they go up on this uh, hill in Japan. And when they get to the top, there's these pillars that say certain like words and whatnot. But it doesn't really mean much. They just kind of walk through it. And it's showing that it's like an ancient place. So and then my story, The Lost King, it's, it's shown in, in the past. So actually, The Lost King goes and uh, he goes to Japan and gains it gets training from the elementals of that time at that place Interesting. But, that, but and but you know that place is now like you know looks new because you know it's not ancient it's current for them so i use kind of like little small details like that i, I maintain it as a shared universe but it's not necessary to you know enjoy the like story you, yeah. you, right exactly okay this one kind of this this question here may kind of be you may have already kind of sort of answered it indirectly, but I'm still going to go ahead and throw it out there. A scientist at the beginning of this chapter, he talks about how there are 118 known elements. Now, I when I read that line and once I got to the end of the story and saw where this was going, I'm like, you know, that's actually a lot of potential for future characters. Now, mm-hmm. you, now I know that you said that you have pretty much got the story, you know, all mapped out and completed for this. But do you plan on exploring all of these other known elements and creating new ones for the story, perhaps? Or is it just like a finite amount that you're actually going to play with and then, you know, the others are just kind of out there to be left to the audience's imagination if they choose to? I'm itching to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. That's a very good, like I told you, there's going to be scenes that are going to come back. Chapter like six or something like that is going to go back and talk, basically talk about that. Okay. Uh, about the 180 ATMs. But no, they're not like, it's it's not as a reference as they're going to be, you know, elementals, like 180 ATMs. Because I was like, that is going to be a big cast of characters. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not going to be like that, but uh, there is a reason why I mentioned it. Okay. Um, so you picked up on that. So you're, it'll be, it'll be nice when you find out what it is, you know, why that was mentioned. Okay. But yeah, most of the things I do mention, one of the things that I mentioned in there too is like right in that same panel, he says, uh, now let's moving on. Let's look at the four states of matter. It's, it doesn't come up again in the story, but I wanted to give that, I wanted to put that in there because it's giving ownage to like where my inspiration came from for writing the elemental balance. If you think about the four elements, right, you know, earth, water, wind, and fire, they sound very similar to the four states of matter, right? Solid, liquid, gas, and uh, 
plasma. You know, if you think about it, it, it almost sounds the same. And so I thought it was really interesting that, you know, in ancient history, these different geographic locations believed in these primarily these four elements and, and they were, they were apart, you know, they were uh, geographically apart. So they all had this similar concept, mm. but then we just disregarded that and said, okay, we have 118 elements, but what if they were actually trying to talk about the four states of matter? And obviously I'm just, this is where stories come from, right? And you just, you, you create a conspiracy. And so uh, that's kind of where my inspiration for these elementals came from. Okay. Okay. Because I, because when I, when I, when I saw, you, you know, that initial panel, I'm like, okay, you know, this is, you know, because it could be just read as like, okay, you know, this is just kind of, you know, filler to just kind of get the, the ball rolling. But I'm like, I think there's something there else <laughs> more to this. Like there's, there's a reasoning behind, you know, what he's saying. Like, now I don't know if that particular character plays a bigger role in the overall story, but I'm like, He's he's dropping little, you know, jewels of information here that may become relevant later. Yeah. And you know what's interesting, though? It, it, that's a smart assessment, too, because when you're thinking about a um, comic book, you know, space is very limited. Mm -hmm. And so I do try to mention a few things to kind of throw people off a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I can't. But like. When it comes down to the editing version, a lot of that stuff I take out because I'm like, all right, some of this is unnecessary information. So a lot of times what gets in the final draft are important information. So sometimes things that might seem like filler could be foreshadowing what's yet to come. But yeah, that's, that's a pretty good assessment on that. Yeah. We will, we'll, we will definitely see more about that, that concept of 118 elements. And it's, I think it's going to be something, something familiar, but something fresh. You know, what most of like what my stories are based off of, they start off feeling something like more familiar, relatable, and then they start taking a direction that just feels kind of different. And, uh, you know, I hope that people like the way I go. I, to me, if it's not going to be different, then why write it or why right, make it? Right, right. Like, why tell the same story someone else has always told? And, I mean, <clears throat> you know, and people have said this for years, and, I mean, it's true. You know, like, nothing is wholly original. Everything is a derivative of something. But if you can find that one unique twist on it, it can make it feel fresh enough for new audiences who maybe haven't had a chance to have that experience yet. And even it's interesting, too, because it's also a little bit of a struggle when, you, when you're uh, presenting your story. People tend to compare it, like, especially when they don't know you. They tend to compare it. And, you know, you know, like, oh, because I've had some people say it looks like a ripoff of, uh, you know, Captain Planet, which I'm like, mm, I, no, I don't think so. Right. But, it's like, I, I mean, guess, not, because there's a, elements of it, I guess, but sure. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not trying to rip off anyone. Like, I, I wouldn't write it if it's going to be a ripoff, you know, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even bother doing that. I would you know, keep that. But obviously, like, I, I grew up being influenced by shows like Captain Planet and, you know, uh, Avatar and watching these different, you know, so sure, subconsciously, yeah, I mean, a lot of those probably do are in the back of my head, and they are in the back of my head. Um, and then I, I've always been inspired by, um, you know, watching, uh, you know, like the cartoons, like the anime, like the, you know, Batman animated version, like those things were, you know, those, the, that it was like those stories tend to be like, I don't know what the right word for it is, but like simplistic in nature, but you know, you can easily follow it and you're entertained. They're like universal stories. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I, where like I anybody wish. can get it. Everybody knows an archetype like that, but it's, it's the, the devil's in the details. Yeah. Okay. Well, just in closing, without spoiling anything, just tell us what do you want to achieve with the rest of the chapters in this story and what kind of journey are you trying to take these characters on? Okay, so without spoiling the story, I'll tell you this. The entire series is actually dedicated to the villain of our story. Um, we don't meet the villain until a little bit later, um, but we find out why all this development is happening. And the reason why is because I'm, I've always been kind of inspired by the villain's uh, character because, you know, when you think about the hero – you know, they follow a social uh, norm of morality, right? They kind of understand what is good and what's bad and, you know, based on whatever the social norm is. But the the villain, if you think about it, they're they're actually doing something different. They're, they're creating their own morality. And what I mean by that is, let's say someone's robbing a bank, right? 
well, okay, we know the Robin and Bank is bad, but whoever is robbing the ba- bank, to them, that's good. Like, they know it's wrong, but what I mean by good is, like, they know it's benefiting them, so they've justified it. You see what I'm saying? So it, so they've kind of taken on this role. So for me, when I would watch, like, um, villains who would want to destroy the world for the sake of destroying the world, I just, I'm like, that just doesn't make sense. Like, you live in the world. Why would you want to destroy it, you know? And so when I would see that, it would kind of bother me. But then, like, I like the villains, like, the way they represented Thanos and, and you know, the, what was it called? Infinity War. I mean, it like, okay, you, you know, I'm not saying agree with him, but, like, he has a reason and he believes in it. And, you know, when you see, like, a character that believes so much in their reason, you can, it's relatable, you know? So it makes the it makes the villain more real, you know. Oh no, no, I I totally agree. It's like you said when they have convictions that you can understand and kind of get behind and understand where they're coming from. It, it makes it easier for the audience to kind of go along with it, you know. Not when it's like those characters like I want to destroy the world, and it's like, well, that what is that going to achieve for anybody? Makes- like unless you're on some kind of suicide mission. Right, exactly. So that's why I kind of dedicated uh, the story. And, and and you know what's going to be interesting is that what's going to happen when you, you know when you get to meet this villain is you're going to go through this wave of emotions. You know, you're going to be like, okay, I understand this point. Okay, I don't get his point. Okay, I understand this point. I don't get his point. You know, you you go through this roller coaster of emotions. And I, I you know, when I would watch shows like you know, I think of like uh, you know, Vampire Diaries. You know how they showed? I don't know if you ever watched Vampire Diaries, but they showed. Uh, I didn't watch it, but I'm aware of the show. Yeah. So there's one of the vampires named like Damon and he's one of those people that, you know, he's first a villain and then you kind of see all oh, the poor guys just wants to be loved or whatever. And, you know, you, you kind of get these different like multi-layered character that, you know, it, him being evil is almost like his insecurity. You know, when, when he feels insecure, he brings his villainous side out, you know? So it's interesting. It, it's, it's multi-layered, you know? Um, so, so like, like I don't make, my villain is not like a hundred percent villain per se. That villain has a core value that people don't agree with, obviously, but he believes in it. You know, so. I don't know. Those are some of my favorite villains. Like, for example, this version of Thanos or, say, Magneto. They have not necessarily justifiable reasons, but you can understand it to the point where it's like, okay, you know, I may not agree with this, but I, I, I can get behind the logic of how they got to this place. And that's what makes it more scarier too, because they're devoted. There's a devotion behind their objective. So when, so that's what makes me feel for the hero and the struggle for the hero, because this villain is so devoted to their cause, you know, and and that adds that element of, of, of scare, because if someone like, if it's a villain who's doing it for money, well, at some point, the villain can say, okay, this is not worth it. You know, I'll go to find something else to do. You know, I'll go find money somewhere else, you know? So I can see that villain backing off at some point with some kind of scenario. But then when you have a villain who's devoted, like Thanos, like he's not backing out for any reason. He's going to do what he, because he believes in it. And that makes it scary. So anyways, yeah, I mean, that's, so that's what we can expect from the future episodes. But, you know, you, you'll, you, you know, you, the audience is going to get carried, and I, I hope, like, the way I've made it is to be very simple, smooth. Um, you know, like, a lot of things are going to be presented. There's going to be a lot of, um, when you start reading some of the future uh, chapters, um, there's going to be information that you're going to want to read again from the first few chapters. Um, and hopefully it's pleasing. You'll, you'll like that detail. I mean, I spent a lot of time put making time maps on like I had time maps on the chart figuring out how to put this detail here put that detail there introduce one thing you know um, so there's a lot of thought put into this story it's not it was not just you know written from point a point b and just revised there was a lot of structure put into this good good well I guess in closing out why don't you tell people where they can find your books oh yeah definitely so Right now, um, we have a campaign going on Indiegogo. We had one earlier on Kickstarter, um, but we have one on Indiegogo where you can order the copies. Um, we're not in any comic book store yet, and I hope to be there at some point. But as we gain popularity, it'll make us more um, plottable to be, you know, it will be more attractive to 
comic book publishing companies, or sorry, like Diamond Comics, the distributor, just the distributors. So, you know, uh, check us out on Indiegogo. Uh, it's called the Elemental Bounce. Oh, yeah. Do, do you have a link? Uh, I do. I can provide you a link. Yeah, I can pop yeah, one down well. in the description for listeners who want to check it out. Uh, do you have a website by chance? I do. Um, it's Um And basically, you can find me anywhere uh, typing Inzane. And that's I-N. Like, it's insane, but just replace the S with Z. Uh, so in Zane Comics, and I'm on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. You know, this whole time I've resisted the urge to do the in Zane in the membrane, but I had to get it out just once. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for coming on and doing this. I had a really great time talking with you and talking about your book. In the future, if you want to come back on once you get your other title out, I would love to have you come back and talk about it. Absolutely, yeah. Once uh, I think once uh, Chapter 3, people have read it, I think they're going to want to know more about it. What's going to happen in Chapter 4? No, definitely, I'd love to come back and, and discuss, discuss it. Yeah, no, this, this was really awesome. So I want to thank our guest, Zane Shinwari, for coming on. And I want to thank you for sitting in on another edition of Talking With. Thanks. Appreciate it. The events discussed in this documentary are based on real events and real people. These are their stories. <laughs> I obviously am your host, Mike C Squared. I got my girlfriend and sometimes co-host Amber with me. You've done a lot of reviews with me lately, yeah. so I gotta get. I'm gonna come up with a name for you. You you won't like it because you won't pick it on your own, but you're gonna get a name. Just give it time. Oh, great. <laughs> You got that to look forward to. But we are here on our special vacation episode to give you a review of Fire Fraud from Hulu. Now, normally when we do these reviews together, we do the mullet style. And if you don't know what a mullet style review is, normally it is non-spoilers at the front and spoilers at the back. But after much thought and reflection, <laughs> I figured that... Since it's a documentary and all this information is public knowledge at this point, like if you wanted to know anything about what happened, you could Google it. And honestly, it was in the, the social media stratosphere and the news so much that a lot of this stuff people already know. The documentary just kind of compiled everything together and gave you a timeline of what happened. So we're just going to outright talk about it. So spoilers i guess not really yeah i'm like it's not really a spoiler i mean you know it, everything that happened you can easily find out that being said though we literally just finished the fire fraud documentary and one of the things that from the outset the moment it started the first thing that came to my mind my first question was how was it that a lot of these kids who went, like, how did they afford to even go to this? Mommy and daddy. That's the thing, though. They they, <laughs> they had people, I think, like, the, the very first few lines they say, there's this guy narrating, and he goes, oh, you're living in your mom's basement, and this, yeah. that, and the other. And it's like, how the fuck were you even, like, where were your priorities in life that it was like, you know what, I can't afford my own place to live, but I'm going to find a way to get money to go to this fucking festival. <laughs> there was going to be lots of bad bitches there. Yeah, man, oh, this, this, <laughs> oh, Lord. Now, everybody, I'm sure, at least has a passing knowledge of what happened with the fire Festival. Um, I, I had been following it when it was going down, but like I said, seeing it all compiled together and getting a timeline and getting some behind-the-scenes information for people who worked for Billy McFarland and just different testimonials from other people, and the social media and the music industry and journalists and stuff like that. I was like, wow, he was on some bullshit. Mm -hmm. So the, the documentary, it's called Fire Fraud, but it's more of a documentary about Billy McFarlane himself. Yeah, because it even starts off with like him as a child, like yes. starting off explaining how he got into this life and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it kind of chronologically goes... 
from his childhood, the different kind of startup businesses that he developed and all the way up until the point of the actual festival itself and yeah. the aftermath after it all went down. So funny thing about it is that Billy, he, he's actually in this documentary because there's two documentaries. There's one that Netflix did, and I think it's just called fire. And then the Hulu one is fire fraud. And Somehow Hulu actually got Billy to be a part of the documentary. And if I was him, I'd be like, hell no. This is already bad on my reputation, but I'm just going to make it 50 times worse. But you know what I think, though? I think in his mind, he thought, oh, well, I can I can use this as a platform to try and justify some of the decisions I made and make me not seem like this nefarious <laughs> villain like Mr. Burns type, like, you know, yes. right. Excellent. <laughs> in, in the background doing all this fucked up shit. But if that was what his goal was, if he did say anything that was redeeming about himself or what happened, they cut that shit out. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it, it, the more he talked, just the digger, the, the bigger hole he kept digging for himself. It was like ridiculous. Like some of his responses to shit and just like, and sometimes I, I, I try not to get too caught up in people's reactions to questions and like documentaries and reality TV shows because they cut and edit stuff together in certain ways because certain looks or, you know, pauses may not have even been to the question that was just asked because it's not like they're playing it, you know, second by second how it went down. So it's like there's there's moments where they ask him like, um, so do you think you're a compulsive liar? And then he just kind of looks off for a minute and just, uh, and I'm like, ah, that, that could have been edited <laughs> that way. You know, like we don't know if that's, or if he immediately answered. So I, I try not to put a lot of stock in that. And there was a lot of times where he just didn't even want to answer the question. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, I, I would, uh, rather not, um, talk about an ongoing criminal investigation. <laughs> and he's like, oh, so you're saying something criminal did happen. Uh, I, I, I don't want to comment on the current situation. <laughs> Drop the criminal part and it's like, yeah, you fucked up. But one of the things that is fascinating about this guy is he he's basically been scamming people since, like, elementary school. Yeah. Because one of the things they talk about at the beginning is he... He, he said that, that in his class, he, he got sat next to a girl that he had a crush on, and her crayon broke. And he tells her, I'll, if you give me a dollar, I'll fix your crayon, or give you a new one, mm -hmm. or some such shit. And he was talking about how in his classes, they, the teachers had these little, uh, I don't even know what to call them. Like a, they said an electronic typewriter. Yeah, pretty much. Right. And, and it was like early days in the internet still. And I guess they were on some kind of network and he found a way to get into it and change the passwords on it. And then when they would log into it, the, the first thing that would pop up not just to the teachers, but to anybody in the class that tried to get on it would be if you need replacements for broken crayons, like, you know, come find me. And then it was like Billy McFarlane or whatever. Yeah. And it was like, well, you, you basically told on yourself from the outset, which that never changes in his adult life because <laughs> no. he, he does a lot of fucked up shit in this and he's signing checks and signing spreadsheets and shit that have fraudulent numbers and everything else in it. And, Shit that did not fucking happen. And he's like, yep, I'm signing off on that. Yep, this is all legit. <laughs> it's like, Don't time worry. to change your name, bro. Man, like, I, I fear for what happens to the world when he finally does get back on his feet. Because you know he got some shit. He cooking up some shit right now. <laughs> like, every waking moment, he's thinking about the next scam. So, yeah, so they, they, they gave a profile of him from a very young age that he has been a scam artist for quite a long time. Like, this is not something new. Like, it wasn't what he kept trying to portray to the media as, like, oh, we had all these good intentions, this, that, and the other, and it just didn't come out the way we wanted it to, and yada, yada. It's like, no, you knew this was bullshit from its inception, <laughs> and you just kept this shit going, like, nope, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. You'll see. W one of the things with him is he he had this this credit card thing like his initial first debit card right right and, and and well like 
he 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 started his business called Magnesis or Magnesium Magnesis Magnesis. That thank you, Magnesis. And it was basically supposed to be like a black car for millennials, mm-hmm. where if you you it would piggyback off your debit card and you get perks and stuff for using it and access to events and this this loft or whatever that you could go and party and hang out with people that were like minded. I don't fucking know. A bunch of like hipster ass sound and shit. No offense to hipsters out there. I don't have anything against you guys, but I was just like, this just sound like some like just give me your money right no it 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 sounded like like a really like glorified starbucks basically <laughs> you know like 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 a glorified uh what is that thing where you can like rent your house out to people airbnb yeah yeah basically that yeah like if they if airbnb and starbucks and like i don't know visa had a baby it'd be <laughs> what magnesis was and i'm just like i guess you know and it was it was pretty maintained to just the New York area, but mm-hmm. he had, you know, ambitions to make it bigger. And he somehow got this guy, uh, Aubrey McClendon, to invest into the whole Magnesis thing. And this dude was like this big oil tycoon, and he owned like some basketball team or some shit like that. And it was going okay, I guess, in the beginning. Um Billy was very smart. Like he he's not dumb by any stretch of the He's very calculated. Yes. And he was basically bribing celebrities and journalists into like I mean they, he had motherfuckers like Rick Ross and all these other kind of people like posing with him and a credit card and all this shit. And it's just like they don't even probably know what the fuck this shit is. No. But he like, hey, you know, he paid me in cash and gave me two hundred and fifty <laughs> grand, so I'm doing it. But but was basically, like, paying off journalists and shit like that to give him good press and talk about how, you know, he's the next Mark Zuckerberg and all this other kind of shit. And he's, <laughs> you know, newspaper covers, like, laying on, like, a bed of women and shit. Like, it's like a bunch of chicks, like, supermodels, like, sitting in a row. And he's, like, laying on them, holding the card up, grinning and shit. And I'm just like, he he was giving this 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 false reality of this lavish lifestyle that he was living that to a degree i guess is true to a point cuz i mean he was doing okay for himself but his whole life was just a cycle of scams yeah and it was just one scam feeding into the next one so much so to where uh the 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 guy that he had helping him that invested into the company he ended up getting indicted on securities fraud and then like the next day died in like a car crash and honestly when we were watching it i was like amber was like oh my god like do you think he killed himself i was like either that or somebody killed him (laughs) because they was like you ain't finna take us down with you with this bullshit because a lot of times when you know people get caught up in you know this kind of like white collar crimes and shit. They start out and other people who were doing shady mm-hmm. shit. And they like, yeah, you ain't finna fuck this up for us. Like, yeah, get this mother. I want him whacked. <laughs> I want him and his family dead. But <laughs> I don't know what accent that is. I don't know why he's in the mafia all of a sudden. I don't know. Like I said, each scam kind of fed into the next scam. Like, okay, so for example, he had this thing where he was selling Hamilton tickets. And it was supposed to be like 200 tickets or something like mm-hmm. that. And, you know, like, like his business partners or employees or whatever, like, there's no way in hell you're going to get, you know, that many tickets and, you know, these seats and this, that, and the other. And he would go on different websites and buy them at some like discounted price or whatever, just like some last minute shit and be handing them out to people like in person at the fucking play. Yeah. As they're walking in the door. Right. He's like, here's your tickets. All right, hurry up. Go sit down. It's like, uh, uh, you know, somebody asked you, is that your seat though? Just act like you were supposed to be there. (laughs) 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 And, and just going through just all these motions and all the money that he would make from that, would be to pay off some other scam shit that he was running where, oh, I got Beyonce and Jay-Z backstage VIP passes or some J-Lo uh, luncheon or some shit. And it was just like he would promise all these things that he could not, ma- didn't actually have materialized at that moment and then would scramble to the last minute to get it done, mm-hmm. but then would be in debt from that because he had to pay some crazy amount of money to actually make the shit happen to kind of keep his good name going. 
And then he would just run another scam to pay off the last one. So it was just this complete cycle of bullshit over and over and over again. And he somehow kept this shit going for years, all the way until he met Ja Rule doing the Magnesis thing. And the two of them together... I yeah I I'm, a I'm bad gonna say combination yeah I'm gonna say the two of them together because you know Billy would would make it seem like oh you know I it was all me and I never this that and the other and Jaru was probably like I got motherfuckers that'll kill your ass if you get me pulled out <laughs> this bullshit and and he they they got together and they birthed this idea of the fire festival now this was supposed to take place in the Bahamas they were gonna have these music acts. And from the outset, I didn't understand the draw to it because they're like, but Blink-182 is going to be there. And I'm like, are, are we like, is that what we're selling this shit on? Blink-182? Like, Kanye going to be there. But see, that's the thing, though, because uh, is it Kylie or Kendall? Kendall. Kendall Jenner was like, oh, yeah, my good music family is going to be at the Fire Festival with this, that, and the other. And I'm like, wait, when did you don't make music? Like, what the fuck? You ain't a part of the record label? Like, that's Kanye shit. Like, what the fuck is you even talking about? Well, because he fucking married to your sister. Now it's like, oh, the good music family. And I'm like, mm, okay. But they made it a point. They never once at any point ever actually said Kanye himself no. would be there. It's assumed that he was going to be there because they're like, okay, it's his label. It's yeah. his, his musical acts and stuff that are going to be there. So you assume, oh, Kanye is going to be there. Yo, Kendall Jenner going to be there. Why wouldn't Kanye be there? And it was like, yeah, but Kanye never came out and was like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I can't wait for the Fire Festival. This and the other. Like, he stayed he knew radio silent. Bullshit. Yeah, he stayed radio silent on that shit for the whole time. And it, it was the the whole thing was kind of fueled off the the fire was fueled by I know don't I'm not I hate puns but but the whole fire festival the fire of it was fueled off of FOMO and I've I've heard people say this before but I was like I didn't know that it was like a, you're a missing out right I didn't know it was a hashtag pretty much at this point and shit but yeah like fear of missing out is kind of what more so than probably the influencers and the celebrities that were going to be there and the musical acts and stuff like that. It was just, it was an event and people felt like if I am not at this or if I don't go to this, then I, my life has less meaning. They're like, I'm nothing. Right. My social status is in question if I am not at the fire festival. And I'm like, I mean, I guess like, I mean, and I don't know, like I said, I, I'm not rich. I'm not affluent. I don't have a lot of, you know, I know I, I do a podcast and you would think like, oh, I'm just drowning in money, but no, <laughs> I wish. Right. Um, I, I, I'm like, does that, is that like a thing? Is it like, do you get your dick sucked more often because you went to the fire festival? Like I was at Coachella where that pussy at? Like I'm broke now, but where that pussy at? Right. Right. I, I live with my parents, but Hey, I was at the fire festival. Like, <laughs> mm, Okay. There's you gotta all be these... quiet. My dad's sleep. He gotta go to work early in the morning. It's like there's all these pictures on my Instagram account of the fire festival. Like, who wants to be my friend? And honestly, I mean, we might not get it, but it's kind of it's true. a thing, yeah. I guess. It's, it's 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 sad, but it's true. And so yeah, so 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 all these people were bound and determined to do whatever they could to get to this shit because they didn't want to miss out on the big event. This was going to be the new Coachella. This was going to be the new uh, 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 Lollapalooza. This is going to be the new uh, Woodstock, you know, is what it was being marketed as. And it, which I still don't get why, because Blink-182 is going to be there. I'm like, are we serious? But anyway, <laughs> the sad part is, is that people were... What there there was a story that one of the guys told where he said he was getting emails from people like, Oh, I quit my job oh, because yeah. my boss wouldn't let me take the weekends off to go to the fire festival or I sold, you know, my, my car, I put a lien on my house, I did sold this, both that, and the my other. Kidney. Right. <laughs> like that didn't happen, but we don't know that. It could have. Honestly, with all the way all this shit went down, it would not have surprised sold me. Sold both my children. Right, like... right. 
I held a motherfucker for ransom. Like I robbed two banks in a Seven <laughs> Eleven. Like all kind of crazy shit. Going to prison after this. Right. I did shit. to go to Fire Festival. I was doing credit card fraud. All kind of shit. Once this this actually starts to become a thing and goes from just a little germinating baby idea and actually starts quote unquote coming together, they started having problems like from the outset because most of the problems of this started because. There were people that wanted to achieve something in a short window of time, but had no real idea how to make it happen. And because you hear it over and over throughout the documentary of, oh, well, you know, I'm sure they'll figure this out. And it's like, oh, 20,000 people are supposed to be coming here and we flying them in on Cessna planes and shit. It's like, oh, I'm sure somebody will make this work. And, and oh, you know, uh, the, the island has like little to no infrastructure and, and we only have like two months to get all this shit built and all these villas and all this other stuff. And it's like, oh, I'm sure it'll, it'll work out fine. And it's like they had lofty dreams, but had no real concept of the amount of time and work that it would take to make this a thing. Because there's a guy that's on there and he's talking about like for the size and massive just workload that they would have to do for an event like this that they were planning, that would have been something they should have been planning like 18 months out. And they bought that island in February. And the festival they didn't was even to be buy the April. island, did they? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that spot that they ended up, you know, Fire Island, that they, they paid for that. But it was, he probably got it for like pennies on a dollar because it was like nothing. Well, they also said it was right off of the Sandals Resort. Right, right, right. But it was basically a glorified parking lot. Yeah. You know, it was a bunch of gravel and undeveloped land and shit. It was like there was nothing there. No, not at all. And they tried to make it seem like, but because it was in such close proximity to that resort, when you Google that resort, Fire Island would be one of the things that would pop up. So you would see that thinking like, oh, yeah, all this shit's connected and it's going to be this great <laughs> just lab. No, no, hell no. Try again. Right. So one of the things that upset me watching this, though, because the documentary in and of itself is played more comedic, you know, because there's a lot of like fucked up shit that happens, but it's kind of played with like this kind of light, airy, like, oh, isn't that funny? You know, all these people got fucked out of their money. And I'm like, no, that's kind of fucked up, man. Yeah. Especially because, you know, you find out that the the workers and shit there, they didn't even get fucking paid. No. You know, they, they still owe them thousands of dollars. You know, the the investors, people like private investors, other companies and stuff, they didn't get their money and shit. And the workers were working pretty much 24 hours a day, getting like three hours of sleep. And it made me wonder, like, what the fuck are the labor laws in the Bahamas? Because Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, man, y'all getting fucked, man. One of the things that bothered me, though, was that a lot of these influencers, and I guess because I'm conflicted, I'm conflicted because... I partially blame some of these celebrities and stuff, but at the same time, I don't really know how I can in good faith because it's not their festival. They just got a check or some money to promote the shit. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like they don't know what's actually happening, this, that, and the other, and they're just like, yeah, I'll make a social media post about the shit, whatever. All and they knew is what to expect or what they were told. Right, or what they were telling them yeah. is what was going to actually happen. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of conflicted, but at the same time, I'm like, I feel like these people tricked, you know, just your average Joe, like, you know, because Kendall Jenner has almost a 100 million Instagram followers. Almost, yeah. And I'm just, I don't even fucking know why. But, because, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to say something that may be controversial. She's not that hot. Like, she really ain't. She's pretty at best. But if she wasn't a Kardashian, if she was just some bitch at the club, you'd be like, oh yeah, she's kind of cute, but it ain't like she got some banging body and oh, this bitch is just like, no, no, not, not even a little bit. I mean, you can sit there and look at me all crazy because I know you like that bitch, but I'm like, she ain't all that. She really not. But, um, I'd take like a half of Kim Kardashian over her. In a <laughs> but anyway, and not to take anything from her, I mean, she's like one of the youngest billionaires in the world or some That's shit like that. That's her sister. So. Was it Kylie? Yeah. Oh, see, I don't even know. See, I don't even know. I can't even tell you this is the part. <laughs> I don't even know. And I'm just like, I sure, you're important because people say you are, I guess. I don't know. She's been modeling since she was young. That's about it. I guess. <laughs> but they were 
promoting it on social media and that got all these other people thinking, okay, this is a big deal because such and such celebrity that I follow on such and such social media said, oh, you know, order your tickets now. And it's like, oh my God, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't remember if they said it or not. Did she actually even say she was going to be there? I don't think so. Because I know she said that the good music family was going to be there, but does that... I think it's all just implied shit. It's implied that Kanye is going to be there. It's implied that Kendall is going to be there. So other people will want to go. Right. But they right. don't outright come out and say, oh, I'm going. Right, right. That'd be a promise. <laughs> and, right. <laughs> yeah, they said, I can sue behind this bullshit. And so they they used these social media influencers to to get social media hype about this thing. And then they turned around and they hired this company called Fuck Jerry, who, which I was just like, all right, which, which basically they are a company that makes money off of memes, pretty should much. Should have been called Fuck Billy. Yeah. Well, that, that wasn't his company though. It, it they should just have hired still them. been called that. <laughs> I'm sure people are saying that like every day of their life now, but especially the investors that he fucked out of their money. But they they are pretty much social media marketing company, and they come up with all this shit that, I mean, like, a lot of the memes that you've probably used yourself or gifts and shit like that that you've seen probably were made by these guys. Unbeknownst to you, yeah, you're thinking, like, oh, this is just a funny thing somebody did and posted it on Reddit or something, and it just became viral. No, it's there's a company manufacturing this shit behind the scenes <laughs> that is making your favorite memes... And making them popular and putting that shit out there. It's like, who knew? I know, right? Uh, the, all the things you learned. And basically, they they came up with this campaign because they went out to the Bahamas and they went to this island, which is not the island that the festival was actually on. No. And they filmed all these like models and you know influencers out on the beach and they drinking they, and right, partying. right, swimming with live sharks in the ocean and, and shit, the piggies. And, right, and and pouring liquor in fucking pigs' mouth. Which I'm like, how is that not animal abuse? It is. I was gonna say because I'm like, ha ha, that's funny and all that, but uh, somebody going to jail. <laughs> like, which one of y'all motherfuckers did this shit? And just all this shit and just making it just this big lavish like thing like, oh, it's going to be the best thing that's ever happened to anybody in their life. And if you don't go there, you should fucking slit your wrist right now because you a piece of shit for not going. And it worked. But the, the most shocking thing about it to me was how it was presented on Instagram. Because they were saying like the goal was to make something that would stop the Internet. And so you would have to, to make something that was visually pleasing, but so against the grain of what you see. Because they talked about how when you go through your feed, you just see a lot of the same shit. It's just like, they just went through a montage of pictures of just like models just posing, like holding a face and looking off all coy and shit. And it's just like just the same shit over and over and over <laughs> Food again. Food and whatnot. Right. And then, so their idea was to just make a orange background. Like, that's it. Like, there's no color gradient, no speckles in it, nothing. It was just a big orange block. And it just had a tag of Fire Festival. And that shit went so viral. And I was just like, are you serious? A L- little behind the scenes shit here. I I know a little teeny tiny eensy weensy, like, not even enough to even really bring it up bit about like you know graphic design and colors and shit like that and and i've tried to learn more as i've done the podcast because i have to you know unfortunately i don't have fuck jerry to you know to (laughs) to promote my shit on social media and shit so i have to promote our podcast on my own and through social media and stuff so i try to make you know thumbnails or little snippet funny videos and stuff like that like different things that hopefully will get people interested in the show and want to see, okay, well, what is this about? Some have been more successful than others and it's a learning process and I'm by no means good by at all, but I'm trying to, you know, get better. And I spend sometimes hours, days thinking about putting together, changing, tweaking 
all this shit to try and make something that's visually pleasing and that catches your attention and go like, oh, what's that? To to make you want to listen to our podcast. And these motherfuckers just put an orange block <laughs> on something and just had everybody and their mama talking about it. And I'm just like, I failed in life. Like, I, I don't <laughs> even know. You know what I'm going to do for this special vacation episode? I'm thinking that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna put a big orange block. And just do that. Make maybe make maybe make it yellow instead of orange. I don't know. It'll be red. I don't know. Blue. Who knows? <sighs> anyway, and that that made its rounds, and that kind of like you know, with the influencers talking about it and stuff like that, kind of started the snowball effect of making the fire festival bigger than probably what it was even planned on being, because it got. Much, much bigger than anybody anticipated. And they sure as hell didn't have the money nor the time and damn sure didn't have the resources to make it a reality for what they were promising. Now, all throughout every step of the way, there's this guy. <laughs> um, His name's Delroy. The bartender. Yeah, he's a bartender. And he had a lot of access to these motherfuckers. Like, I'm like, for you to just been the bartender, like, they had you, like, you was part of the crew or some shit. Yeah. And he, he pretty much put them on blast about everything. Like, he's like, this shit ain't gonna work. Okay, I I gotta do it in in the Delray accent. He's like, this isn't going to work, man. He's like, we do not have the time for this. (laughs) Okay, I'm, I'm not doing his accent justice. And he's like, he's like, you know, like, like, y'all gotta get y'all shit together. Like, if y'all finna go forward with this shit, like, you need to be doing X, Y, and Z. You should have got this shit ordered yesterday. Like, y'all out here partying and drinking and on jet skis and all this other bullshit. And it's like, this ain't coming together. And it damn sure ain't finna come together in the time frame that you've promised. And apparently, when they had set the date for the fire festival, there was also this thing that goes on in Bahamas where they like, race boats or something i forget what they said it was called i forgot too but but, it but was the, the go- biggest weekend yeah 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 he said it's bigger than christmas down there you know and i'm like okay and they told him like hey you should cancel it you need to change the date like there's not gonna be cars and not gonna be hotels because all these people are gonna be down here for this shit everyone was telling him dude cancel this change the weekend do something it's mm-hmm. bad news yes yes and they 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 push on anyway they're just like whatever like like it's 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 gonna be the event was so big at that point that even if he wanted to stop it the event was so big before it even existed even if he wanted to stop it he couldn't it it was too late like it it, there, there was too many wheels spinning he was spinning too many plates at that point too many people got money invested into this shit now it's like i can't go back now like this even if it's a shit show which it is he had to fulfill his quote unquote promise. Now, the island that they picked out had little to like no infrastructure and it was basically just a big ass gravel pit. Like there was no fencing or anything, so like there was this big cliff you could just fall off of and shit. They they had promised these villas and people were paying like two hundred thousand dollars or some crazy shit. And the villas literally did not exist. No. Like they hadn't even made them. And people were paying for something that wasn't even materialized. And I guess Billy just figured, like, oh, I'm sure we can just, you know, somebody will take care of this shit. We can just order it on Amazon and some shit will be fine. Which these, you know, luxurious villas that were promised to people, this is the part that actually made me angry. Some of these social media influencers, the bigger ones, they got into villas. Mm -hmm. And everybody else was stuck in tents and shit. And, and I was like, the FEMA tents. man, it did. It straight up looked like a fucking disaster emergency relief camp. <laughs> yeah. Like there was like a hurricane or some shit and people lost their homes and had to just live there until they could rebuild or something like those tents had no bottoms, like no lining, nothing. It was just the gravel. It was just a white pit or a white tent over a big ass gravel pit. Some of them didn't have beds in them. No. Like, like, like the lockers and shit that they had for like them to keep their belongings. Looks like they just took it out of Six Flags. Like, we're stealing this. Right. And just <laughs> dropped it in the middle of the fucking thing. It's like, there's no like padlocks for half of this shit. The, it, it was like one set of lockers. And it's like, you have like 200,000 people coming down here for this shit. And this is what you just threw together at the last minute. 
it was it was a shit show. Like even when they were building it, uh, what did they say? The police came and shut it down. Like a few days before. Yeah, because yeah, because it was uh uh. Because they they were uh, breaking the labor laws. Yeah, is the reason, and they, they weren't shut that paying down. their like fines, the contractors and shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and they weren't paying their taxes on shit. Yep. Like, <laughs> like there's a point where like there's all this merch that's supposed to come in that they were gonna sell, like this fire festival merch, and they couldn't even sell the merch because they didn't pay the customs tax to bring it into the country. And I was just like, oh my god, like they dropped the ball. It's like, how do you not even bother to research this shit? And the whole time, he's in debt. Like, ridiculous amounts of debt. His grandchildren will be in debt. Man, pretty much anybody who has the last name McFarlane, you might not even be related to this motherfucker. You're going to be in debt because of the (laughs) bullshit that he did. (laughs) And, I mean, so much so to the point where he is making like fake spreadsheets with like all these like different artists that are going to be at the show and how much they got paid and this and the other to convince investors to give him more money to try and keep this bullshit afloat. And it's just like, what are you doing then? But it goes right back to what happened before. Everything he does is a scam to pay for the other scam. Yeah. So he's constantly, he's falsifying documents, he's lying about this, that, and the other, about how many people are going to be attending, how much money he's invested into it, the lodging, this, that, and the other. It's all bullshit it, just to convince other people to give him money to put back into the shit that he's promising that he's going to, you know, make happen, which doesn't exist. He then goes to the point where he has the Fuck Jerry company going and systematically deleting and blocking, deleting comments and blocking people who are like on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and shit asking like, hey, like they even had like keywords. Like it, he said it got so bad to where if anything that came up that said festival in it, they were flagging yeah. that. And I was like, God damn, like it's called the fire festival. Like what the fuck? You can't talk about it. Right. It was like fight club. It was like, what's in the first rule about fight club? You don't talk about fight club. Like it was crazy. The fact that, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but the fact that the Fuck Jerry company continued to promote this shit and continued to work for them, because they must have been the only motherfuckers that were still getting paid. They even said the, that. the musical acts didn't get paid. Because no, because remember, they were promoting it all the way until the day it happened. You know, they were like three oh, yeah. days left, two days yeah. left, you know, this, that, and the other. And... and and to ask them to go like, hey, if anybody says anything negative or disparaging or even questions the validity of the festival, of the, the lodging, of how they're going to get there, of what acts are going to be there, delete their comment and block them. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that is not a good look when you got to do resort to shit like that, especially when a lot of the people who were probably questioning that shit probably had tickets to go to this shit and they're trying to ask you questions about it and it's like uh, uh blocked them <laughs> and it's like motherfucker you got my money like uh. relevant man i mean okay they had <laughs> they had um made up this other thing like uh, a week or so out from it or i don't know how many how long before it was to where they now they do actually do this at festivals and stuff to where it's like a cashless event and you get wristbands that they scan and you just upload money to it and you pay for stuff that way while you're there. They made these 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 uh wristbands and they told people that they had to upload money to it in order to buy stuff that, for currency there. And they told them that it would that they had to put at least three hundred dollars for each day that they would be there. Now, this was a two-weekend event. Now, I don't know if they were supposed to go back home and come back or they were going to stay for just, you know, the whole stretch of time from one weekend to the next until it was over. And basically, he was using the money from that to pay off a loan from some other motherfucker that he got to invest because he needed money to not do whatever the fuck he said he was going to do because <laughs> none of this shit actually came out. And it was just fascinating to just watch him billy himself try to sit there and explain a way like he legit 
would I could totally buy like if he pops up on news tomorrow like oh and he was also a serial killer like I believe it oh yeah because he would straight face look dead at the camera and be like no I invested this much of my own money into it you know we had this many customers base and yada 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 and it's like no you didn't and it's like they have testimony from people who worked from you they have actual documents and shit like that you speaking at events. Saying, oh, I said this, that, and the other because there's a point where he gets all cocky and shit. He's like, tell me one thing I lied about. And they give him, like, five examples. Man. (laughs) It it was just, like, absurd. And it's just, like, it, it, it never, there was never a point where he was not willing to do whatever he had to do to keep perpetuating the lie. It was not about getting these people a good experience. It was not about making sure that he was providing a good service to make sure that people would want to come back. It was, I have to at least the thing that I promised on make that happen. Even if it doesn't come out the way I said it would just so I can then say, Oh no, we have the festival. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, no, I, I said it. I it said happened. It Blink one eighty two. <laughs> Apparently, the whole anchor to this entire thing, like, right before, like, the the festival was supposed to start, they pull out. They're like, you know, after much consideration, is any other, you know. Like, the day they were supposed to go down there. Yeah, they were like, we're not doing it. And then after that, it was kind of like a domino effect. Then none of the music acts showed up. Like, honestly, I don't know for sure, because they don't say it in a documentary, though, but I don't think anybody actually showed up for that shit. No, they said none of them did. Yeah, which I'm like, God damn, man. I'm like, you couldn't get Lil Yachty to come out there <laughs> and, and, and perform at this bullshit. And I don't, like I said, apparently Blink 182 was the anchor to this shit. Cause once they pulled out, everybody was like, Oh, well, if, if Blink 182 is not going to be there, then uh, I, uh, I can't be no part of this. But honestly, I think a big part of it was, they didn't get fucking paid. No. Like, like a lot of these motherfuckers, it's like, you're not going to get them to come do be party on nothing without paying them up front. Exactly. You know, and it's like, and, and none of them were being paid, but he's constantly telling people like, oh yeah, yeah, we paid this, that, and the other person. We got all these musical acts coming and shit. Fucking Jay-Z going to come down from a hot air balloon. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, no. Gonna be drinking liquid gold. Pretty much. Right, eating right. like king. Right. Fucking uh, Bella Hadid's going to be out there giving blowjobs all night. It's going to be a great time. And it's like, no. None of this shit is going to happen. None of it. And <laughs> they 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 didn't have villas for them to stay in. The musical acts dropped out. They couldn't pay for that. They couldn't even get the grounds finished. There was no beach for them to go to. The beach was five miles from where they were actually having there was a festival like no at. no bathrooms. These motherfuckers are in porta potties They was giving them fucking cheese sandwiches i don't mean grilled cheese cheese. right and not even grilled cheese just cheese sandwiches with like some lettuce and tomatoes on the side it was like like, a little salad it's like you couldn't even afford bologna like what is this you could have put spam on this shit something man anything like they're like we got a bunch of protein shakes like ramen noodles (laughs) are like 10 cents a pack like Honestly, that, that, that was probably, they probably had a truck full of that too. They was like, once we run out of these cheese sandwiches, it's down to the ramen. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and look, like, but don't give them the flavor packs though, cause that's gonna be the next thing we're gonna have to just pass out. But they had two million dollars of booze. Yes. That's, that's the, that's the point I'm getting to. They, they couldn't provide any of this other shit, but they made sure to buy two million dollars worth of alcohol. It's like these people are getting drunk off their asses. They need to put something in their stomachs. But see, that's the thing, though. I'm pretty sure it wasn't an open bar. So they had to pay pay for for the alcohol. So so he made sure every step of the way, everything he did, it sounds like it's a shit show, and it is, but every step of the way, he was finding ways to keep making money off it, even though he knew it was going to be fucked up. Yeah. Because he knew once the people got there that this shit wasn't going to play out the way it was supposed to. And... He's like, but hey, look, I, I can sell merch there and I, and I can get them to buy alcohol and shit. And it's like, who wants to buy a shirt from this bullshit? Like what, what we went and we're stranded in the Bahamas for like a week. And like, what? like, no, it, it, it comes to a point where people are tripping because they don't have a sign tents or anything. Half the temps don't have beds in them and shit. And his team is working 
to try and like, you know, get them ready. Like he was saying like 10 by 10 or something like that to get everybody set up and stuff in eight tents and make sure they have somewhere to be at. And then Billy just stands up on a table and he's just like, everybody just go grab an empty tent. Like you see when it's empty, that, that one's yours and go grab some mattresses, throw it in that shit. And there you go. And it was like all the work that his team was trying to do to make it an organized thing. He just he threw just it all out the fucking fire window. to it. Get out. <laughs> Get out. And it, it's, it was just fascinating to me how little amount of planning went into this, but no one at any point speaks up and says like, Hey man, um, this isn't going to work like this. Delroy is the only motherfucker throughout this whole thing. That was, he, he was the main one that was like, yeah, man, this shit ain't going to fly like this. We, we can't do this. They were, it was so bad to where they were throwing luggage out of shipping containers oh, yeah. and shit. Like they didn't even have a system set up for people to get their bags once they landed. Like it was ridiculous. And they were promising them VIP jets to fly down there. They flying in fucking coach and shit. It was just like, riding oh on a God. school bus. Yeah. Like, Oh, rickety ass. Like not even a magic school bus, school bus. It was just some like the short bus type shit. It was absurd. There's like shipping containers everywhere. There's bulldozers and shit that are just sitting off to the side because they ain't get to finish their work and got everything shut down. It was, it was, it was like a fucking like post apocalyptic, like people were comparing it to like the Hunger Games and shit like that. It was like, what is this shit? One of the things that I loved about it though is that they, they, pretty much straight up confront Billy during the thing and they like man like you 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 own some bullshit like mm-hmm. you were a compulsive liar you did all this illegal ass shit and there's a moment where Billy asked to take a little 10 minute break yeah and 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 the whole time I'm like I'm just waiting to hear like glass break and an <laughs> alarm go off from this motherfucker trying to escape the building and shit cuz I'm like oh he ain't coming back but he does. Oh yeah, but he like is dead silent the rest of the time. Oh yeah, now he's on his whole. Uh, uh, I can't comment on you know shit, and it's like okay, see, you might as well just left if you was gonna come back yeah. for this bullshit. So he ends up getting sued for a hundred million dollars, and Ja Rule and a few of his other business partners get pulled into this shit. And Ja Rule, this whole time, you know, we gotta clarify, has been adamant that. Oh, no, uh, 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 I was just, you know, I was just a celebrity promoter. I ain't got nothing to do with this shit. And it's like, no, nah, motherfucker, you were a vital part of this. This was this, your idea. It, right, which he fucks up and tells himself later. He was a vital part of this every step of the way. Then he gets arrested by the feds for wire fraud. And <laughs> while he is on bail, he is still doing this ticket scam selling scam shit like oh i get you tickets to the met gala and the victoria's secret fashion show and all this other shit and there's a dude on there he was like you i've tried to get tickets to the met gala you can't he was like i've tried to get tickets to i really tried to get tickets to the victoria's <laughs> secret show he's like you can't and he's actually like a venture capitalist who's like rich and got money and influence and shit and he's like no man like he's promising these people bullshit but he's doing it under this 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 alias, uh, well, I guess not an a- alias, something Frank Trilby or some yeah, shit like some that. Yeah, some other person. Yeah, and people were thinking like, oh, you know, the email list that he had for people from the Fire Festival, he sold that to some other company, and they're sending people these emails about this shit. No, 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 it was still him doing it. And he would have a different dude, I guess the real Frank Trilby or somebody, talk on the phone so they wouldn't recognize Billy's voice, but it's Billy behind the scenes puppeteering and orchestrating mm-hmm. all this shit. And it's just like, you're on bail for federal wire fraud crimes. Just like, sit down. You're being sued for a hundred million dollars, and you still trying to nickel and dime these scams and shit. And it's like, even if this shit was working, you ain't finna make two hundred million dollars off of this shit. Hell no. It's like, only thing you're doing is further putting yourself in more risk of new crimes being brought up against you. That poor man's girlfriend. Like, this this poor girl, she sounds like she's French or some shit like Something that. Something like that. And she's just, well, you know, I, I, he was just such a nice guy, and we did all these fun things together, and, you know, one day I Googled him and, and saw this horrible stuff that, you know, he's being accused of, and he said, and the other, you know, but but he said that, oh, he just lost track of reality, and yada, yada. And I'm like, no, he was scamming motherfuckers. <laughs> and he thought he would get away with the shit. Yeah. 
and when he got caught up, he was just like, oh, I, I didn't know I was just living this life that I couldn't maintain. Like, no, you were on some bullshit. Mm-hmm. And you knew you were on some bullshit. And that poor girl, like, he's in prison serving a six-year sentence. And she is still with him. Like, receiving letters and getting phone calls. During the documentary. You're like, yeah. you're like just tell him, tell him, tell him. Because he, she gets the call. And then she just walks off. But but it, it's so funny, though, because she's like, oh, this him. And it's like, you have a call from the federal inmate. But yeah. he's like, uh, Billy McFarlane or Willie McFarlane. Willie. Willie. Willie Billy. <laughs> oh, uh, he, he taking some Willies in the ass, probably. But, <laughs> but now he's in prison and he got fined. I think they said like $26 million. It was something crazy like that. Yeah. And and he still got the lawsuit for the $100 million. And but now that Billy's in prison, though, he started this music entrepreneur business for the inmates <laughs> there. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Like, the only way we're going to stop him from scamming motherfuckers or trying to scam motherfuckers is y'all going to have to put a bullet in his ass. Like, give him the gas chamber or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Like, Just put him in, what is it, isolation or by himself. Something, yeah. Solitary confinement. Like, he can't never interact with another human being for the rest of his life. <laughs> it's the only way this shit is going to stop. But, like I said, it it's all played for fun and games and shit, but the sad part is, is that there are a lot of people who paid a lot of money to go to this shit who are not going to get refunds back for this. No. Did not get the experience that they were promised. There's a lot of investors and shit that put a lot of money into this. They're not, are not going to see a return on the investment. And then the, the biggest victims out of all of this are the poor contract workers and vendors and people who were promised to be paid and were worked like ridiculous amounts of hours that are never going to see a dime of that shit. No. And I mean, my first day, the first time you asked me to work almost damn near a 24 hour shift and if I ain't getting like money up front, like if I ain't being paid about a day, I'm out. Like, like see ya. There ain't no amount of overtime you could promise me that'll make me keep coming back and doing this bullshit. Like no. But one of the things as we wrap this up that I wanted to talk about was Ja Rule <laughs> and him being a uh, part of the lawsuit. He, was actually recently on a podcast where like they just get drunk and talk and shit. And, uh, that's what we need to start doing. But, uh, uh, sh- shout out to Basada Geek. Like if you could just like give me a bunch of cocktail ideas and we'll just start drinking <laughs> during the podcast. Uh, get on it, Stork. But <laughs> they have him on there and he basically admits that the festival was his idea and pretty much implicates himself in being involved from like the beginning. Yeah. Even though he swore up and down that, yeah, I ain't got no part of this shit. And it's like, now you do know that you're in the middle of a lawsuit and that they're going to see this mm-hmm. and they're going to use this against you in court. But get that motherfucker drunk. What, what did Delroy say? Uh, uh, a drunk truth is a sober truth or whatever. Or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. A drunk man's tongue is the sober truth or some shit to the effect of that. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that was some deep ass shit. And he wasn't bullshit. <laughs> like, Dilroy was like, yeah, you get these motherfuckers fucked up and they'll tell you all kind of shit that they ain't supposed to. He was like, oh, shit, did I say that? Whoops. Uh, I mean, uh, it was all Billy. He's like, no. He'll wake up in the morning like, did I really say that? Yeah. They're like putting handcuffs on him while he's on the podcast and shit. You just hear click, click. Like, yeah, you done fucked up. At the very end of this, though, what was the funniest part to me was that Hulu fires some hell of five shots at Netflix because Netflix has their documentary and that documentary is actually produced by the social media marketing company that marketed the fire festival in the, in the first place. So the same company that knew step by step that it was going to be a fucking disaster, but kept marketing it all the way to the end, then turned around and produced a documentary about it and sold it to Netflix. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, damn, like y'all getting paid no matter what. Cause like I said, they had to begin paid cause they, they've marketed that shit all the way to the end. Or they just in so much debt right now, they needed some kind of money. Well, they, they were supposed to be getting caught up in the lawsuit, but then they did a written letter like, Oh, just like the, the ticket buyers, uh, we were, uh, we were, you know, frauded by, uh, um, Billy and we were just doing what we were told. And I'm like, bullshit. The moment they tell y'all as a company, your own, f- for the sake of your own livelihood as a business, the moment they said start blocking motherfuckers for asking yeah. questions about the festival and delete their comments and shit. 
that should have been the biggest red flag you could have possibly had needed to be like, okay, we, we can't fuck with y'all no more. No. Like something ain't right about this shit. Like even if it is legit, the fact that you would even ask us to try and censor this shit from people, it's like people who are probably customers that bought tickets and shit and paid for these villas and got money loaded on these wristbands and all this other bullshit. Like, hell no. They, this lawsuit is still ongoing. Billy got sentenced to a six year federal prison sentence and he has to pay it back to like 26 million. And Ja Rule is, <laughs> is, is, is making this app that was basically the same thing as the fire app that Billy and him were working on together, where it's basically like tender for celebrities where you can swipe right or left to like get people to show up at like your kid's birthday party or some bullshit or <laughs> hey your you know, wedding or right 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 and i'm like damn like are y'all hurting for money that bad where it's just like yeah i'll go to you with prom or whatever like sure how much you paying but yeah so i guess that's just the state of things but i think if there's a lesson to be learned from all this it's do your research especially when it comes to something that sounds too good to be true it because probably is. Yeah, because there's a lot of points throughout this that cuz there was even that that guy he he made that uh that Twitter account called Fire Fraud mm-hmm. and was, you know, telling people like man this shit is bullshit, don't get no money for this shit, like this dude's a scam artist, like don't do it. And if it, it there were so many points along the way where if people would have just actually done a little bit of research, they would have found out that a lot of the shit that he was promising and where it would be at and what it would be like would not be what it was, but nobody, they were so caught up in the FOMO. If they would have just looked into Billy himself. Oh yeah. It would have been yeah, done no. there. So yeah. So for anybody out there, like the next, next big thing that's coming out, like do your research, actually look into this shit and don't, Research it from the official website of the thing. <laughs> like, go do your own independent research. Because they ain't never going to tell you on there in, like, no small print. Like, uh, the the island pictured in the advertisement will not actually be, you know, <laughs> Fire Island. Like, they're not going to tell you none of that shit. It's like, don't ever go to the first ever anything. Pretty much, man. Just the same way we talk about don't buy the first generation of a new technology. Don't be the first one to go to, or to some shit that's for the first time. You wait till it's, like, the second or third time they have it. Then go check it out because yeah. then at least you know, hey, it was at least successful enough to where they're doing it again. Now I can feel confident and go into it. But I mean, there's a sucker born every minute. So <laughs> this is on Hulu. So if you have it, check it out. If not, the one on Netflix I heard is still pretty good as well. Um, it, it basically covers a lot of the same stuff. Um, they didn't get Billy for that one, though. They were unable to get him to be a part of that one. And from what I hear, the tone of that one is less comedic and it's more like of played as like a tragedy and more serious about it's how like, it all went down. We're the victims. Right, right. Which, I mean, there are a lot of victims in this shit. Oh, yeah. Like, like I said, a lot of people got fucked. All that being said, though, Amber, what would you, out of our five tier rating system of break it down for the people? Really fucking liked it. Liked it. Meh. Hated it. Really fucking hated it. All right. Out of those five, what would you give Fire Fraud? I liked it. I like documentaries. It kept my attention. Mm-hmm. It was pretty good. Mm-hmm. So what's keeping you from really fucking liked it? Mm-hmm. Just out of curiosity, not trying to point a finger at you. And then like, why the fuck do you like this more? <laughs> I don't know. Like I said, it was interesting. And it had a lot of points of views and whatnot that I didn't know. I don't know. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go really fucking liked it. Mm-hmm. I thought that it was presented well. Um, you could say to a degree it was kind of in poor taste that they made it so comedic. But at the same time, I I think that sometimes making a joke out of something is a good way to get your message across to people. Yeah. Because I feel that comedy can sometimes help people hear a point of view that they necessarily wouldn't listen to. Mm-hmm. Or see something in a different way that they would normally ignore if it's not 
presented in a comedic way. So I, I like the way the documentary was, was presented. I really like the fact that they actually got Billy to be a part of it <laughs> and they confront his ass and call him out on that shit. Like that was the best part of the whole thing. Like to the point where he's like, I, I gotta go to the bathroom. He's sweating and shit. He, uh, uh, I, 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 I his lawyer go. from the bathroom. Right, right. He's like, uh, they keep asking me all these questions about this shit. He's like, what the fuck do you think they was gonna do? <laughs> like they was gonna go there and be like, oh, well, you know, you're misunderstood. We, we, we get it. You know, we, we had a festival that went to shit too. You know, we know how it goes, right? Poor Billy. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, I really fucking liked it. I liked the way it was produced and how in-depth they went with everything and all the uh, interviews that they did with different people. And the fact that they got the main guy on there is, is like, probably what put me over just liked it. Because I was like, you know, it, it was good, but the fact that they got him made it just, wow, just see his face when they called him <laughs> out on that shit. He's, uh, uh, I didn't know you was actually going to ask me real questions here. Like, yeah, motherfucker, this ain't. You know, you ain't on Good Morning America and shit. This ain't Fox and Friends. Like, we finna get in your ass on this shit. If you have a Hulu uh, subscription, definitely check this out. It's about an hour and a half or so. Yeah. So it's not very long, but it, it it covers a lot of information. And it's a real engaging way that they present it. So I think if you got, you know, hour and a half to kill, you will not be bored. If you don't have a Hulu subscription... I don't necessarily think you need to get one just to see no. this, but it is pretty good, though. Just watch it on Netflix, yeah. the other one. Yeah. Or if you don't have a subscription service, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> You're missing out. Yeah. Thank you for sitting here and listening to one of our reviews again. I'm going to figure out a name for when we do movie reviews. Like Mike and Amber talk shit about movies or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> we watched another movie today. Right. We will talk to you guys next time. Amber, tell the people bye. Bye. Well, that was fun now, wasn't it? Well, kids, we are going to leave you, but do not fret. We will be back to our regularly scheduled podcast next week. But until then, that is it for the show. Remember, you can always find us at our home at onegiantleapforgeeks.lipson.com or you can listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music, or anywhere else you get your podcast. Make sure to show us some love, so go ahead and hit that like, subscribe, rate, follow, review, and all that shit. And if you do have any questions that you want us to answer on the show, any comments, criticisms, or you just want to say hi, you can email us at officialoglfg at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter at Giant Leap, the number four geeks. We're also on Facebook, Reddit, Instagram. Just search for One Giant Leap for Geeks. All right. Have a good night. Bye.